Uh, hello, everyone. Oh, sorry, wrong slide. <laughs> hello, everyone. <laughs> okay. Morning. Very good. Very good. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to. Um, so my name is Arthur, and I'm very happy to um, um, welcome here, welcome you here to the first edition of the Open Source CubeSat Workshop. And I really like to uh, start uh, this workshop with a quote from uh, Linux Torvalds, who is the inventor of Linux. And the quote goes like this. So for those of you in the back who didn't bring their glasses, I will read it out. <laughs> I'm a lazy person, which is why I like open source for other people to do work for me. So now you know why you're here. <laughs> uh, you might want to know a little bit about the background, how this all came together. And like many things here at ESOC, it all started over a good cup of coffee. So it was uh, in early this year, in, in spring, uh, when Redouan Bomga and I, we were in the canteen, and we were thinking about where we could, or which conference we could attend this year to present our ideas uh, on open source for CubeSats and space exploration. And we realized that there are not so many. So um, at the same moment, we also realized that Hey, <coughs> we are here. <coughs> sorry, we are here at ESOC, where they have uh, conferences and workshops uh, every week. So how about we just uh, book a room for two days and uh, invite a few people uh, to talk about open source for CubeSats? Well, uh, it grew a little bit bigger than that. So in fact, we have uh, on the registration list for external uh, participants, we have uh, more than 90 people registered. And we also have uh, um, on-site ESOC people, so contractors and staff attending here. So we're quite uh, a crowd of people. And um, well, we have, um, if you look on the uh, nationality list, we have almost 30 nationalities uh, represented here. Uh, that means that every third one uh, in this room has a different nationality, which I find uh, is quite amazing. And we have people coming from really far away. We have uh, people from Argentina. Where? Yeah, Where are you, you raise your hand. Okay, so we have uh, someone from Egypt. See here, did he make it? He's in the queue, I think. So. Maybe, yes. <laughs> uh, India. All right, yeah, okay, they're all coming. Uh, Japan is here, good. And we even have uh, a few people from Germany, I heard. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so good. Yeah. Um, okay, so with such a diversity in the room, I mean, we have different languages, uh, different uh, culture, different way of thinking even, but at least there's one thing that unites us, and that is the uh, interest in open source. Um, so, um, yeah. So first we should maybe talk about what do we understand um, uh, by open source and how this uh, connects uh, to space exploration. So first of all, it's about um, free sharing of what uh, one has done, not only for the benefit of oneself, but mostly for the society at large. And I think this is what science is really all about, that uh, to improve the living for all mankind, for all uh, living, including non-humans. So, And it's also about uh, putting collaboration before competition. And by realizing that by, doing, by working together, we can achieve much more than, uh, than on our own. And it's also about advancing the status quo, so <laughs> doing uh, things in a different way. It may not always succeed, but at least, uh, well, I think that um, you can learn as much from failures as of being successful, so that's important as well. And yeah, so what are the goals of this workshop? <coughs> so as I mentioned already, um, we uh, want to learn from each other. Uh, so who in this audience has built uh, or worked uh, or is working on a CubeSat? Please raise your hand. So a lot. And who has launched a CubeSat in space already? Okay, so, so about the other people. Do you know these guys? Have you heard of their CubeSat? That's why it's also impor important to build networks. So to bring people together and to, uh, to, to, to work together and inspire each other. Uh, but most of all also, we really want to see how open source can push uh, space exploration further. 
Okay, so just short uh, overview on how we want to uh, run this workshop. Um, so first of all, uh, we want you, the audience, to be in the center. Okay, I'm out of the video now. There's the uh, video recording going on here. But we want really you to be in the center of this workshop. And what we don't want is a single person standing here in front uh, and you sitting here taking a nap or playing with your smartphone. So we want to have this uh, very interactive workshop. And how we're going to achieve this, uh, we will tell you later. And yeah, be nice to each other. So it's totally fine to have uh, heated discussions uh, and some arguments, but uh, yeah, please be respectful to each other and respect each other's opinion. And most of all, uh, let this workshop be fun. Yeah. So uh, at the end, I really like. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, the organizers and sponsors. So we have uh, uh, the ESOC Cybernetics Club, which is just across the road. And then we have LibreCube and LibreSpace. They will give also uh, a talk in this keynote, uh, in this welcome session. And then our sponsors are Vision Space, Carton, and the ESOC um, um, or a club organization. So with this, um, I'd like to hand over to Red One, who's going to chair the welcome session. And yeah, have fun. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Arthur. <laughs> so I am Rodwan Bungar. You can call me Red. This is easier. Uh, I work here with Alessandro Donati in the back on advanced mission technology, and I do machine learning for space operations. So it's not about me today. I'm going to pres to introduce you the the next speakers. So and the next speaker is uh, is a bit special for him, uh, and that's his quote. Challenges are there to be mastered. And uh, we're here to create challenges and to master them. So that's quite cool. So he's, he's former director of uh, space programs at DLR, which is the German National Space Agency. And uh, he's, uh, he, does, he does run marathons, uh, better than me. And uh, today he's our director of operations at ESOC. And uh, this is uh, Rolf Denzing. So please, Rolf, this is uh, your turn to tell us about uh, uh, your point of view on open, open source and openness. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the European Space Operations Center. Arthur, is it OK if I stand here? Or want me to Perfect, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's more the conventional way. I'm, I'm an old guy, and uh, uh, you may do things differently, and this is, uh, and this is good. Uh, so diversity, uh, creativeness, uh, inclusiveness, uh, freedom to think, to work, this is what we need, and this is uh, what this is about. So I can only congratulate you on this initiative, and I hope uh, uh, Red and you, Arthur, uh, have plenty of coffee over here. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm an old guy. So ESOC is around since 50 years, and this may be an opportunity uh, to look at uh, what we have done so far as a matter of intro uh, introduction for you, so you know where you are. In fact, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary today, being founded in the year 1967, and I believe the majority of you was not even born back then. So we have missions underway to most planets of the solar system. Uh, we have had close flybys uh, and landings uh, on comets. Uh, we have landed on the uh, Saturn moon Titan, uh, a very uh, cold uh, environment, uh, the farthest away landing, uh, planetary landing ever achieved. Uh, we also have deep, mis deep space missions underway, uh, XMM Integral, exploring the X-ray and the Gamma Ray uh, universe. Uh, what else have we done? Uh, uh, Gaia, uh, mapping the stars. Uh, it has more than one and a half billion uh, stars in its catalog uh, to provide the, uh, the map uh, for astronomy. This is the reference when you point your satellites uh, this is uh, where you get guidance from. Uh, so we have tried to land, I must say, last year on Mars. Uh, this was what we call the so-called uh, cheap test lander. We just did it uh, for a limited amount of money. Uh, so the test, uh, I'm firmly convinced, was successful. Uh, we learned a lot out of this, the engineering part of it, but we did not land on one piece, unfortunately. So I cannot say this was a successful landing. Uh, what I personally have, uh, uh, have learned from this 
landing on Mars you cannot do for cheap. Uh, it, uh, it needs some effort. So, and then, uh, of course, it's not always easy going to, uh, uh, to worlds far away. For example, landing on comet uh, chilyumov gerasimenko as we did uh, with Rosetta. Uh, you all know that it's uh, always a small line that you have to walk. You cannot take an infinite amount of fuel because the rocket would never lift up. On the other hand, uh, if you do not take enough fuel, you will fall short of reaching your goal. And uh, Rosetta has traveled 7 billion kilometers through space over 10 years, and uh, people in our flight dynamics team uh, got very creative. Uh, so with several gravity assists, uh, swing bys around Mars and Earth, uh, they finally managed to get to Rosetta, uh, to uh, Chiriomov gerasimenko and even managed to put a lander down on a rock the size of four kilometers. So, and of course, we do also play around in labs. Uh, so we here we, we also have a, uh, uh, it's always good to see uh, diverse, young, creative people uh, looking around. I wonder whether there are uh, uh, women in space also. Hope so. If we want to really get the best people together, I think we need to include everybody. Uh, uh, independent of gender, of, uh, of age, of color, uh, whether handicapped or not. So we also uh, fly missions around Earth. May it be for exploring the, the Earth system. Uh, global warming uh, comes at mind, for example. And uh, we are operating a number of missions on behalf of the European Union uh, that really deliver operational services every day. And uh, this family of Sentinels, uh, and those are twin satellites, as you may see, for Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, they deliver operational services to the people every day. Uh, for example, when it comes to food security. Food uh, uh, used to be subject to speculation on the, uh, on the stock market. Uh, for example, in the Mekong Delta, which is the food chamber uh, of the Earth, uh, uh, harvest predictions uh, for rice were speculated uh, on the stock market, uh, which uh, can lead to effects that artificially the price is, uh, is moved up. And at least uh, by looking at it uh, with satellites, you can make reliable predictions uh, on uh, what harvesting will be, and you can take the speculative element uh, out of uh, uh, food pricing. And, and this way, uh, you can secure food, uh, food better than uh, uh, if you leave it up to speculation. So ESOG is also home to our Space Situational Awareness Program, encompassing uh, space surveillance and tracking. Uh, after all, we are at an age where mega constellations are about to be launched. Uh, OneWeb has announced the launch of uh, 650 about satellites to provide internet from the sky, starting mid next year. And uh, so one Soyuz would uh, throw out uh, 32 to 36 satellites and uh, this will not make the problem of uh, space debris easier. So today we have about four and a half thousand satellites in space, 1,500 of them are still operational. And uh, so this number of satellites, these are uh, non-operational, non-cooperative spacecraft are uh, in my mind uh, ticking time bombs. And uh, this is why we have to be very careful uh, when launching mega constellations. Uh, we also need to think about uh, how, uh, how to end their life. Uh, what will happen if they become inoperational, uh, inoperation, if they go out of operation, put it that way. So uh, today, uh, space debris mitigation guidelines uh, call for deorbiting if it's worth orbit within 25 years, and uh, maybe we need to revise this. Uh, then we are expecting an announcement by SpaceX, uh, uh, who may launch more than 4,000 satellites, and this would already double the population in space. CubeSats, by the way, uh, are steeply increasing as well, and uh, 
also, I guess, here it would be a good idea to uh, deal with end-of-life measures. So then, under space situation awareness, uh, we look at space weather, which may harm sensors in space, whether they are on a big or small satellites. Uh, but space weather can also harm what's going on on Earth. For example, increase uh, radiation levels for polar flights. Uh, for example, have an impact on uh, deep drilling for oil, for example, because uh, uh, these drills are guided by navigation uh, signals. And due to solar events, the uh, protective uh, magnetic shield around Earth can get disturbed. And this, again, can lead to, uh, uh, to disturbance of our navigation signals. And then, of course, we are dealing with uh, near-Earth objects who most of the time fly by Earth. Uh, so it happens very rarely, but it happens. It happens and it will happen uh, that an asteroid, meteoroid, uh, will hit Earth in a fatal way, has always happened through history of Earth. And this, of course, is, uh, is a danger for humankind, uh, for the very existence of Earth. And uh, so what we are doing today is uh, monitoring and predicting. And what we need to do in the future is also to demonstrate means for deflection. So uh, Armageddon and Bruce Willis uh, is not that far-fetched, I would say. The good news is that the bigger those objects are, the better you can predict them, uh, the more head warning you have. And I believe it's a global responsibility to take care of the danger arising from mm -hmm. near objects. ESOC in a few numbers, as I said, uh, we are around since 50 years, having operated 78 spacecraft. Currently, today, we have 21 spacecraft under operation. Uh, attempted, uh, done three solar system landings. Uh, next spectacular one coming up in the year 2020, where uh, we are trying to put a, uh, a car-sized lander on the surface of Mars. Uh, with a drill uh, mounted to it, so we have mobility and uh, uh, probing into the ground of Mars. Uh, Going to be exciting. Uh, in ESOC, we have uh, some 900 people. So under space 4.0 is what we call it over here. It's uh, called new space elsewhere. Uh, the Earth seems to rotate a bit faster than before. So what it needs to survive in this scenario is a change of paradigm. It's uh, uh, creativity, uh, speed to market, and probably a new, a new chair of roles between public actors and private actors. So we see private investors uh, uh, taking charge of things, for example, building rockets, uh, building mega constellations, and uh, even even flying payloads uh, to moon, at least proposing so far. I don't know whether somebody knows uh, Planet Labs, for example. So not even science is for granted as a possession, as a position, as a possession of space agencies. And uh, so th these are not the days for space agencies to lean back and to say science is mine, exploration is mine, human spaceflight is mine. Mind you, Blue Origin uh, is doing uh, private uh, investors are doing uh, human space flight as well. And uh, so, and therefore CubeSats are a good way uh, to keep up, uh, to exploit our creativity uh, of getting fast in testing sensors, uh, of employing the brains of a large community. This is on slight modus, but never mind, I was, uh, coming to an end anyway. So let's uh, work together, uh, bring all our ideas together in the spirit that uh, Arthur and Red have mentioned under their leadership. I guess uh, this workshop has potential. I wish you all the best. I wish great results. Uh, you all have some good coffee in ESOC. And uh, I'm looking forward to maybe see you back, back on a regular basis. So all the best then. Thank you, Rolf. So Rolf has a meeting, so thank you for your time. And uh, 
and we'll take the comments and bring them to you. <laughs> to you. Um, so uh, next, we're going to have some few important points uh, on the workshop. Like, uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to people with T-shirts, or the demo area is going to be there, and those kind of things. We have the post there over there, and uh, if you need uh, any information on the on the program, we have printed some of them. But I know you're connected, so fully. So, uh, do we have uh, women in the room? Uh, no. Could you one, two, three, four, five, six, Set seven, seven? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, okay. Okay. What are we guys doing? <laughs> no, that's cool. Uh, we don't have zero. Uh, eight. Sorry. Yeah. Cool. No, it's even better. So uh, th our next speaker is uh, uh, made it through the German border control, uh, but uh, but uh, we do we do we go through the your slides? Do we go through the next speaker? Yeah. Okay. Now we can uh, go quickly through the program outline. Um, We Just can to go to, yeah, so quickly. Know what's going to expect you here. Okay. Whoops. Was <laughs> 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 the joke? So <coughs> we are right now in this welcome session. Uh, after that, we are directly going over to the uh, session talks, where you have uh, uh, 20 minutes per presentation, whereby 12 minutes of a talk, and then the rest should be for an interactive. It's not Q and A. Uh, it's more like an interactive uh, yeah, discussion yeah. on the topic. And what is important is for lunch, you have to stay here because uh, I will give you direction for, for the visits. We, we offer you visits from spacecraft uh, operation engineers. Yeah, so we are alternating during the lunch time. We have yeah. the tours and others go to lunch. Yeah. And uh, The point is that after the tour, we're all back here and uh, we, we can uh, share, share our demos and the demos we're bringing. Then we continue with the with another session of talks, and then we have the work group uh, part or the roundtables, which will take place in the canteen. So we have to go over there. Yeah. But don't worry, we instruct you uh, how to reach yeah. there. Something important, maybe the uh, to find the toilets. You just go outside. There are some signs. Um, then for smokers, just outside, uh, opposite, you find a smoking area. And yeah, no well, you can go smokes. there. You can also no go a little bit out there to get some fresh air, maybe not too close to the smoking area then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but please don't start exploring uh, ESOC on your own uh, because uh, yeah, that's a no-go. You will get a tour. Some people tried, we don't see them anymore. But uh, for, <laughs> for the work groups, uh, you have a uh, uh, few flip charts you can use. You put the title of your idea and your name so we know that you brought up the idea and some area so people can vote for your idea. So it becomes a, a topic that will be discussed in the work groups. So we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Right? And then Maybe tomorrow we, we continue in the morning with uh, mm -hmm. session talks. And uh, session six, we also have pitch talks. Red one, what is that about? Yeah, pitch talks. So uh, we had a lot of uh, contribution from everybody. Unfortunately, we could not uh, accommodate everyone. So we have a, a small session. You come to me, and uh, I will gather all the topics, and you will have five minutes on stage to share your idea. Okay, yeah, and, and then just before lunch, yeah. you can elaborate those ideas further over the lunch. Uh, then we continue with uh, demos, um, another session, work group again, and then finally we do the wrap up. And now the uh, important thing, so for tonight's social program, uh, at the end of the uh, of today, there might be some open questions and uh, some discussions might be ongoing. If you cannot solve this by uh, discussion, then uh, you can solve this by laser. <laughs> so we are going to uh, uh, go over to laser tech, which is walking distance from here, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and uh, you can shoot at each other. Um, <laughs> so everyone is invited. Uh, we have the entire area booked, so we've we can fit everyone. Uh, you can also go there if you don't want to play. Uh, there's a bar. You can have a drink there. Yeah. And uh, afterwards, we're going to, uh, I should mention that, sorry, this is a sponsored event, so free of, free of charge. Everyone is invited. Afterwards, we go to Braustübel, the German restaurant, uh, which is the, uh, also just next by to the laser tech place. Uh, this is not sponsored, so you have to pay on your own. Um, no still, problem. I recommend you to drink as much as you can. But not more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good then. Then okay. So our next speaker, um, 
as I was saying, made it through the German border. It's not ex-KGB or ex-CIA, but uh, maybe because he's the co-founder of the first uh, hackerspace in Athens, and uh, or maybe because he's creating a network of ground station. Uh, today is the community architect uh, at Mozilla and at the Libor Space Foundation. This is Pieros Paparias, who's going to talk about Libor Space Foundation and what it is. Pieros. <laughs> Uh, thank you all. Good morning from me. Uh, this is uh, less of a talk, more of a welcome, uh, oh, you know, uh, speech basically. Um, so my name is Pierre Spadeas. I'm a board member at the Libre Space Foundation. Um, and what Libre Space Foundation is is um, basically an open source, global foundation, non-profit foundation, creating Libre technologies, open source software and hardware for space. Um, we, you know, originally are from Greece, Athens, uh, but now we've grown to, to have members all around the world. And um, our projects um, pretty much include everything in the um, uh, wide spectrum of uh, activities across all different things that uh, can be considered uh, space industry. Um, more specifically, on the upstream sector, um, we have the, um, the construction and delivery and operation of uh, UPSAT. Um, that's the first open source, um, completely open source um, uh, satellite, CubeSat, that we delivered last year and was launched this year and it's actually up, up there right now, operational. Uh, well, we'll talk about that in, in depth on a talk today. Um, and then on the midstream, on the operation side of things, we have a global network of ground stations. Uh, the name of it is Satnox. Uh, and we're going to be having a talk about it tomorrow. Um, and we'll be sure to reach out to all of you to create as many ground stations around the world as possible, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the downstream side, uh, we also have uh, multiple um, different applications and the research that is happening from a global um, corps of volunteers, basically, um, on Libre Space Foundation. Uh, we do a bit of rocketry too, sometimes. Um, when we uh, first had some discussions with um, Red and uh, Arthur around, well, how we can advance the open source mission around space and what can we do about it. Um, as Arthur well positioned it, um, there was nothing out there uh, pretty much. So we had to have a parasitic relationship basically with any other conference that is out there about uh, CubeSats or space industry. Uh, so we figured that we should um, you know, co-organize uh, open source CubeSat workshop. And I'm actually more than excited to see, you know, a, a room full of people right here today. Um, and I would like to thank you all for coming. Um, you represent a diverse background um, with companies, projects, academic institutions coming together with a single uh, focus on around open source and space, which is great. And we haven't seen that before. And I'm super excited to see not only what happens in those two days, but how we create those communities and relationships. Uh, to move forward and expand the ecosystem of open source um, in space. Generally, open source has proven itself on both the business model alignments and also the um, development you know, types and development uh, processes and development models on many different industries. And I think it's um, we all think in Libre Space Foundation, actually, it's that it's time to prove this on space. And we should do that all together. So let's claim space the Libre way, and I'm, um, I'm really looking forward uh, to talk to you all uh, and see how this happens throughout those two days and then creating the ecosystem after that. So thank you all, and thanks for coming once again. Thank you, Pedro. It's okay. You can keep it if you want to ask yourself questions. Oh, okay, no, cool. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's fine. So Pieros came here uh, with uh, six other colleagues, right? From Libro Space, who is from Libro Space Foundation? Please raise your hand. One, two, ring, ring, ring. and over there. All right. Yeah, we're everywhere. So yeah, you can tag them and, and reach after them. So which is nice when we organize those kind of events is that we do outreach. So we outreach to external people, and uh, I even visited uh, Japan and uh, and visited the the small set team, uh, the national small set team in Japan doing amazing things, but also internal outreach, so which is amazing. Uh, so um, so we, we get to know the, the right people. So like uh, Frank Zippenfeld, so he has been working for 16 years at ESTEC. This is the, the space uh, research center, the biggest space research center of ESA in the Netherlands. And uh, for him, ESA misses out on various innovations, as ESA cannot easily engage with non-space players. 
So, and uh, I'd, uh, I'd love him to, to come on stage mm -hmm. and uh, because he's working on future projects with SATCOM and he created a makerspace we'd love to hear about. Thanks a lot, Matt. Good. Um, no, thanks, Arthur, for uh, putting up those slides. Good. We are working in the other part of ESA. That's a large technical center in the Netherlands. And uh, specifically, uh, I'm working in a group which is working on satellite communications. Thanks a lot. And uh, basically, we are at the, the funding side. So we, we spend money to do research and development for innovative projects. And they should be in the area of satellite communications. And we would like to uh, maybe give you a bit of an idea. We have no very, let's say, high level thoughts on open source. We see open source used in all of our projects. That's a done deal for us. But a bit more, let's say, practical ways how we get more of those developments going. Now, what we uh, normally do, do is, is funding projects either 50% or 100%. And that is, um, you could say, up to a few years ago, very much with the traditional players. Let's say we all, I think, know the large European primes, uh, quite large missions, satellites of 300 million plus. Uh, but now that world is a bit changing. And specifically, telecommunications is a commercial applications. All the satellites that were uh, presented by Rolf Densing, the, let's say the director of ESOC, uh, there is not a telecommunication satellite because that is a commercial business. Other people operate those satellites and we fund basically upstream the technology developments that are necessary to keep also European and industry, European and Canadian industry competitive. So that's a bit our daily business, what we do. Uh, out of those uh, contracts and, uh, sorry, sorry that out of those contracts, uh, we see all kind of equipment uh, coming up, either some equipment that ends up in space, uh, equipment that is for the payload, things which are sold, uh, let's say, by the millions on your L&B, let's say, many of those contracts are basically having some heritage in, in co-funding from our side. And uh, you can see that, uh, let's say, this is an example of somebody that makes a bigger tank on a satellite, and there's a commercial business case behind that. The tank is twice as large, means there is fuel, uh, more fuel on the geostationary satellite, you can sell more transponders, so there's a, a quite, let's say, a clear business case. But now, we are getting into the area where also we as a space agency start to fund all kind of innovative ideas really at the, at the low end. For example, this is one of the pocket cubes that we fund, the pocket cube, let's say five by five by five centimeter, with a company in Glasgow, Arbit Orbital. And uh, this is, you could say, this is the smallest and cheapest satellite ever that we have co-funded in ESA. Uh, this is an example of the project that we are also doing. But we would like to actually engage even more with people who have innovative ideas and are, let's say, the open source proponents, the radio amateurs, hacker spaces, etc. And you can maybe already maybe deduce a bit from some of the ESA programs, we have sometimes difficulty engaging with that. We don't have the, the instruments for that. We, are, we can buy a 300 million satellite, but to spend 5,000 euro, that's difficult. So we tried to get some, uh, let's say, instruments together where we, we, co we call them makerspaces, which are focused on specific areas to be able to engage with the community, which is, let's say, the non-traditional ESA bidder. Newcomers, radio amateurs, inventors, and so on. So we started these things. Uh, we have three of those makerspaces now uh, planned. One is running. We have one which is working only on machine-to-machine -machine and Internet of Things communication. That's an upcoming area where we see a lot of small satellite players. So we have reserved half a million. That's quite a lot of money, we find, also because we want to do projects in the area from five to 30,000 euro, quick and dirty, no ESA quality standards, limited documentation, and share. That is the whole point. We would like, we pay this 100%, so we also want the results coming back to the community in terms of, of uh, webcasts, uh, seminars, etc. So this is running at the moment. We have currently a tender open, so we are waiting for competitive bids in the area for software defined radio. Now there is an enormous, I think, a wealth of applications and new boards, new equipment uh, coming in the area of software defined radio. So that we would like to stimulate. 
And we have in the area of 5G communications, let's say an upcoming area where we will use a lot of terrestrial developments in space uh, also planned. Just an example of what we're doing in Dublin. This is a, a space near the Dublin City University. And uh, we do, for example, uh, existing commercial terrestrial standards over satellite. Just reuse the technology and see what you can get out of that when you run that over satellite. Uh, that's a 10,000 euro project uh, using Cloud RAN, let's say complete ground station in an Amazon cloud. See how expensive that is, how, what can you really achieve with an Amazon cloud service if you just buy that for, let's say, 100 euro per month. We will have a challenge. It's now running for the most wearable L-band device, for example. Now, these kind of things, we originally we would not have the instruments to do that. We will also look at the use of blockchain over satellite. We will use the FPGA service that Amazon is, is offering now in the cloud, where we could rent, let's say, high-capable uh, processing, let's say, for one half hour, uh, when the satellite comes over, maybe during the 10 minutes only, uh, with FPGAs. The other two maker spaces, one of them, as I mentioned, is out for tender. We will do one for software defined radio. And later on, we will, in, that's in 2018, we will tender a maker space where we basically want to steal as much as possible from all the research and development which is already happening in the terrestrial communication. Let's say if we talk about satellite communication, let's say we are dwarfed by the R&D budgets by a Qualcomm, a Huawei, and everything which happens in the terrestrial world. We should be modest there. So let's reuse as much as possible from that world and see how we can use that for space communication. Good. Um, Red, this was all uh, we wanted to say. This is more our, let's say, practical approach, how we would like to um, uh, okay. come to more open source developments and share that with the community. That's super. So we, we have uh, some time for reaction from, from you guys. So you've seen all this. Maybe you have uh, one or two questions. So yes, uh, Karthik, please take my microphone. Um, I'm just curious if uh, the, the IP side of it and legal side of it has been worked out uh, by ESA or is it a work in progress to understand, for instance, within these makerspaces when something is invented, something is created, um, is it sort of incidental case by case now that you're trying to understand how to engage with the open community or is there sort of a strict policy? On no, there's the no IP strict policy. This okay. is a case by case basis but in principle maybe sometimes that's also a misunderstanding everything that is developed under ESA contracts at least in our program the IP stays with the company so uh, sometimes patents are requested by ESA for the whole community but in principle the company itself is the owner of the IP and then of course it's up to him to share we have in a number of contracts we have explicitly mentioned we want to see this as an open source development. So also including, for example, a year of, develop of uh, maintenance and support. Yeah. One question yes. Are you concerned by uh, ITAR regulations? Uh, for instance, uh, you showed FPGA example. So FPGA space qualified uh, are not available in Europe uh, without uh, ITAR regulation, as far as I know. So uh, are, are you concerned with this kind of limitations? No. And you In, uh, for us, the, um, it's nice to have ITAR free things, that's true. But on the other hand, uh, satellite communications is a commercial market. Uh, if there is somebody who has a launch offer where you are allowed to have ITAR equipment on the, on the launcher, let's say he has an advantage. So we make an effort to have some non-ITAR developments, but in the end, it's a commercial market. Yeah. Hi, Frank. Um, I'm interested to see that you're working with the Dublin University Makerspace. Um, makerspaces traditionally, sort of before universities started running makerspaces, have been more grassroots and come out of kind of perhaps community kind of development. I was wondering whether would, would um, ESA um, be happy if they were approached by um, a kind of more grassroots makerspace organisation rather than a makerspace sited in a, in a university? Yes, uh, by all means. Uh, we are, let's say, we are a bit constrained by, we want to see a, a satellite communication application. That's where we need our, we need our use our money for. Yeah. But uh, 
we are actually discussing with a number of people who would like to start also something like a makerspace driven by them, not by us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Frank. Uh, we have to keep up with time. So I'll introduce the next speaker. Thank we, we can thank Frank. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I won't introduce you much, but uh, I have some notes. So at age of 12, he had his diploma in Aachen, and he created his first CubeSat. At 13, he made his master in Taiwan, and he created his second CubeSat, and he experienced the 50-50 success rate. So during his five years at ESOC, he created Libre Cube, the LibreCube initiative, and he will tell you why. Arthur. OK, thanks. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, so um, I'd like to now give a little bit an overview about uh, what uh, LibreCube is all about. Uh, so let's start off with uh, there's a revolution in space going on. So maybe it's not that much a revolution, maybe it's more an evolution. What we see is that we have an increasing, exponential, exponentially increasing number of launches of small satellites and uh, in particular CubeSats. And also there has been, since the beginning, Sputnik, here it was a small satellite. So there has been small satellites ever, dins, ev ever since then. Um, but it's really only since the invention of the CubeSat program that defines a standard interface so that you're independent of the launch rocket that you really, um, that this really took off. So we're talking now about uh, dozens of um, CubeSats being launched into space. I think Planet Labs, they have now more than 100, maybe 200 of them in space uh, and uh, mega constellations is the buzzword these days that m might be uh, based on CubeSats or um, small satellites. Wow, so great, no? I mean, that's uh, space exploration is really boosting off. Well, maybe not so. Because if you look at the um, success rate of uh, CubeSats in space, in particular for academic missions, from university missions, it's about 50-50. Um, and so the question is, would you launch uh, a stone of that size uh, into orbit, being a threat to astronauts and other satellites? You don't want to do that, but you're doing it if you launch a CubeSat that's failing. So what we have to, well, that's the thing, I guess, uh, that you have to live with when you are innovative, right? That you have to take failures into account because you're trying out something new. Um, but uh, yeah, what we see here is, is quite some examples of innovation. We have uh, Ardusat, that's uh, what they did is they put an Arduino, which cost like 30 euro or so into a CubeSat and launched this into space. Uh, and then another example is PhoneSat, which is, uh, yeah, they, they took a smartphone and uh, also put this in the CubeSat structure and launched this into space. So, wow, that's crazy ideas. I mean, that's really innovative, isn't it? So. I don't think so much that it, this is too much of uh, innovation. Uh, for me, if you send a smartphone into space, then it's just like this. You're sending a smartphone into space. And actually what I'm seeing, uh, what's going on a lot, is that uh, we're using terrestrial solutions uh, to, to make a cheap uh, CubeSat and make a cheap access to space. So we're using I2C as the onboard bus. We're using internet protocol over radio link, uh, we're using uh, SD drives as onboard storage. And um, I think the direction is, is good, but it's, it's not, not how it should be. So I think we should rather focus a little bit more on using terrestrial, te terrestrial technologies because they have evolved a lot over the years, in particular recently, but we should still apply space engineering thinking on top of this. And that's, in fact, why the LibreCube initiative was founded. It's, uh, we don't want to see any more CubeSat failures, uh, in particular for academic missions, where you are really uh, behind uh, achieving a, s a scientific goal, and you really should make sure that, uh, or should be able to have a mission that is working. And we want to access uh, space. We want to open access to space to everyone. So LibreCube is based on uh, three pillars or principles. The first, obviously, is open source. And I don't know about you, but when I was a student, I had access to a lot of uh, nice software tools, 
uh, for free, so student licenses, or it was available in university. But once I graduated, all of this was gone. And in particular, I could not uh, modify and look into my uh, master thesis work, which I've done in MATLAB and Simulink. So that was really frustrating. Uh, and then I found out that actually for all of these tools, there is an open source and freely, free of cost, available alternative that may or may not be fully comparable, but you can get the job done with uh, completely free and open source tools. So what we are going to do in LibreCube is not only we are going to work on open source CubeSat modules, but we also exclusively use open source tools so that everyone in the world can basically participate independent of their budget. And uh, yeah, so open source everything. So uh, the next thing is standards. Um, why do we need standards? I think you should very well aware uh, um, uh, why, you why we need standards because w later on when you're going to charge your mobile phone or your laptop, there's a charging station here in the corner. But what you will need to bring is an adapter because uh, if there's not a unique standard, then there will be many different standards created. And um, this is the same in the CubeSat community. And this is actually a paradox that on the one hand, CubeSat, the success of CubeSats is based on that it's a standard interface, so that's independent of the launch rocket. Y um, so the outside is completely standardized, but everything inside is not. It's free to, to the developer. And uh, I agree that it's nice to have this diversity, but it's also not very economic, and uh, none of the systems can be easily shared uh, with each other. Okay, so the question is, um, before I go there, so the question is, um, we need standards, but where do we look for standards? So our requirements were, they must be freely available, uh, they must be openly accessible to everyone, and they should have some, there should be space heritage behind them. And uh, well, are there some of them? There are. There's in fact two big organizations in the world that do just that. The one is the ECSS, European Committee on Space Standardization, and this is all the different, these are not the standards, these are just the areas that they cover. So each of them have uh, dozens of different standards. But what they cover is, um, yeah, how to manage a space project and how to operate a space project. Um, so more on the process side. And then we have the CCSDS, um, standardization organization, they cover um, things or uh, data interfaces, uh, protocols, data formats, so more the IT side of a, of a pr um, program. And um, yeah, so there are dozens, even hundreds of standards out there, so it's not an uh, easy job to go through, uh, well, to know which one to use, uh, but you don't have to do uh, this task of going through all of them because I did this already. And I wrote a book about it, a handbook you can download from the LibreCube.net website, and I have a printout here. And basically it's a summary of what of these standards could be useful for a CubeSat. And also, there are so many standards available, they obviously will not cover everything. And one typical example is the interface between uh, these CubeSat boards. So this is, there's no standard for this, there's maybe some best practice. So some of the standards have to be created uh, by us uh, in the LibreCube community. Okay, so we have open source, which is uh, for sharing, uh, then standards to make, thing to make sure that the things can interact uh, and don't explode when you plug them together. So what's missing? The big picture is missing. So I showed you this picture already, this, uh, this one here. Uh, this is basically a breakdown, uh, o overview of uh, the elements of a typical um, space mission. You have your ground, your ground station, your mission operations center, your space uh, assets, uh, spacecraft, launcher, and so on. And um, yeah, that's what we want to do, uh, basically, to break down a typical CubeSat mission uh, into, uh, into its elements and um, define the requirements of, of all those elements. And of course, every mission is uh, different and unique, but many of these elements are just repeating. You have star trackers, you have uh, your power supply system, and the idea then behind this is that once we have all these requirements defined, then people can start off in developing solutions for that, and they can add additional features. So you can have the uh, same power system with the same fulfilling the same requirements, so it's being compatible, but at different features. It has maybe more storage, energy storage, uh, and so on. And uh, 
Yeah, so we want to even go a step further that once we have this uh, reference architecture for building a space mission, uh, we can in fact reuse all these elements for terrestrial applications because for a rover, a drone, robots, you also need um, uh, all these elements, communication system, power system, and so on. And what you see from the graphic here is that we urgently need a, gr a, a designer because this is so crappy. But <laughs> Okay, so by now you surely uh, would be very excited uh, and want to know how to contribute and that's very good because uh, LibreCube needs you. So the first thing is uh, you would go to the website, uh, find on how to join the mailing list, uh, maybe uh, think about which work package you can contribute to or, or, or um, propose and reach out. I will be here the next two days, so yeah, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Arthur. So, has anyone some uh, remarks or comments for after on LibreCube? Yes? Please tell your name and uh, what you do during the night. <laughs> My name is Juan Luis. Uh, we will talk about the night uh, later in the evening. Uh, you, uh, you talked about the tools that you are using for making the reference implementation of the uh, LibreCube. What is the uh, commercial tool that is being most difficult to replace so far? That's very easy to answer. It's a CAD tool, so for a, a mechanical design. So uh, there's um, basically two open source uh, software packages available. One is FreeCAD, and the other one is OpenSCAD. OpenSCAD is more your kind of programming your structure, um, and the uh, FreeCAD is more like a CATIA or Solid Edge, but it's really it needs uh, much more contribution to uh, to really uh, be capable of doing uh, achieving the goal. So far, it's really early in the process. Hi, Arthur. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the um, the failure rate being fifty fifty, and maybe it's a bit provocative. But if you compare that, for example, with uh, our record on Mars landers, which is pretty much zero out of uh, two. Um, it doesn't sound that there may be some other explanations uh, other than applying ECSS and CCSDS standards. And one thing you didn't mention was the review process. You can write all these requirements, but if you don't, if you don't conduct the reviews in a very meaningful way, mm -hmm. then the whole process doesn't work very well. And uh, if, you, if the objective is to get through reviews without having solved the problems, then uh, it's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah, that's absolutely correct, and that's why all these uh, three things work together. Reference architecture, standards, and open source. Because, um, uh, so the idea is very simple, uh, and because the QSET is a standardized format, if somebody does structural testing for it, then others can build upon this experience. They don't have to necessary necessarily repeat the entire testings because it's already proven the for the structure to work. So that's the whole idea behind it, that we define requirements, but not every team has then to go through and confirm all these requirements because some already did. Uh, or the other example would be a university, uh, let's say in Argentina, is building a power system and testing it rigorously and it's working. And then others, uh, maybe in Taiwan, they can reproduce this and they work instead on an on a, on a onboard computer and thereby they reduce the cost and overall the reliability, reliability goes up. And just a final word, uh, the 50-50, maybe I made this a little bit up, but it's more or less, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's right to the point that people are building new CubeSats um, and they start from zero, from scratch, and they make the same mistakes all over again. Um, and that's why we should also, yeah, learn from each other and f learn from the mistakes and don't repeat them. He Hello, regarding different open source licensing types, uh, LibreCube Foundation has any analysis or recommendation of which one could be mo more suitable for an open a project in this context? Yeah, so there's, um, for the hardware, there's this Tupper license. Um, in fact, any open source license will do. That's up to the contributing team. Um, but some are m better than others in the sense, from the open source sense, they're all, all okay. But if you go uh, more towards this Libre and free, to keep things free, then it would be more into the GPL, for example, for software. 
Um, but it's a whole different topic, and I have, in fact, written a paper on this, so I can give you more information. Okay. Can you take your mic? And well, thank you, Arthur. <laughs> so, um, uh, thank you, and I'll introduce the next speaker, who is uh, kind of our keynote. He came from India. He's a 29-year-old uh, system engineer, and uh, he's been uh, working with Tim Indus, the Google X Prize uh, team for India. So please go, Dieter, uh, share with us uh, how open source is making space for you and for everybody. All right, thank Thanks. you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Gurudatya. I work at Team Indus as a systems engineer on the communication systems. So I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about what we're up to. Uh, back back at Team Indus, so we're uh, we're essentially targeting a moonshot, which is basically to land on the lunar surface uh, uh, as part of the Google Lunar X Prize competition. Uh, send back high definition videos and imagery back to the Earth, uh, and of course, rove by 500 meters. That's 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 our little moonshot that we're actually trying to do. That's part of the Google Lunar X Prize. Um, we're uh, we're, we're essentially, uh, uh, I mean, uh, trying to be the first private entity to ever do so. So uh, that's that's what our endeavor is all about. Uh, that's uh, sort of like a mock-up of what our rover looks like. That's our previous egress mechanism that you see there. Um, yeah, and uh, we're basically, uh, as, as part of the competition rules, we're uh, doing this as a private competition, all of this demands a lot of rethinking, a lot of you know innovation in terms of how you would have earlier gone about standard space technology systems. So, uh, as a private company, we are trying to do that. I'll I'll just walk you through about uh, about you know how we've tried to uh, you know optimize the way we're using tools today uh, since we're privately funded. <coughs> So yeah, uh, that's a little bit about what our journey has been about. Uh, we've started practically uh, with the mission concept around uh, 2012. That's when our mission concepts took, uh, what to say, the takeoff uh, towards towards the moon mission. We've we've been at it for a while, and now in 2017, uh, we 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 feel uh, with our qualification stage that we are on the right track for uh, you know for that final launch. Uh, this is what we're trying to use for the uh, moon mission. So we're uh, we're having a, la a lander or a spacecraft and a little rover that roves around on the lunar surface. Um, we sit aboard the PSLV XL, which is uh, something that uh, you know that's that's the uh, ISRO's uh, workhorse, the PSLV. Uh, we we've designed our entire uh, mission. We've qualified our entire hardware uh, and systems aboard for the launch. Uh, aboard the PSLV, so that's that's what we have. We have like a 600 kg uh, lander uh, with with a payload carrying capacity of around <coughs> 20 kgs on the uh, lander itself. So it's a four-wheel rover. It's semi-autonomous. That's what roves around on the lunar surface. It's called ECA, which is uh, in Indian, it's ek choti si asha, which is basically a small little hope uh, of 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 our entire mission. Yeah. Uh, so this is a rough idea about what we're uh, what we're doing. We're doing orbit raisings. We raise our height. Uh, you know, we we actually launch get launched to a height of around 880 kilometers above the lunar surface. Uh, we re keep raising our uh, orbital height, and uh, such comes a point where uh, the lunar gravity is you know strong enough for us to actually start getting uh, uh, you know captured by the moon's gravity itself so after that uh, we begin a we, we begin a series of burns to descend uh, onto the lunar surface we reduce our orbital heights and finally arrives at a point uh, where we begin the trickiest part of the mission which is the descent so yeah going on to uh, <coughs> who i am uh, i i work at team indus on the communication systems uh, so uh, working on the uh, you know lander to uh, Earth communication systems, making sure that that works well, working on the uh, rover to lander communication, making sure that we are able to talk back to our rover 
while it's on the lunar surface. So that's what I, I, I do there at Team Indus. And uh, just to give you an idea, these are all the subsystems aboard. So there's, of course, a myriad of uh, systems on board, both the lander and the rover. <coughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's, of course, a certain replicability of the rover and lander systems that, 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 that happens on this. And uh, yeah, so to accomplish all that, we've, uh, we've had to really rethink how we go about the, uh, the software aspect of it. So uh, it wasn't like, you know, we had all the softwares, uh, all, the, all the hardware available from the very beginning. So we had to ideate very heavily. We had to figure out, uh, you know, where we actually make a balance between systems that are available outside where we need to build upon them and where we need to actually go out for uh, you know proprietary softwares so we've had to create a sort of uh, you know uh, a mixture of an approach towards the uh, entire software and simulation aspect and uh, i think most of us uh, most of the subsystems during the ideation and development phase has relied on open source software because uh, let's say for the mission analysis uh, there's been a lot of uh, you know, uh, question as to what's the reliability and what's the accuracy of that tool. So we had to first build upon our entire strategy up to a particular phase for that version of, let's say, the of let's say GMAT, uh, and then go on to other tools like you know ODTK, etc. For 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 uh, you know uh, for the other aspects of the mission and and the analysis. So we 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 could sum that up that uh, the entire you know, methodology that we've adopted was for a faster takeoff on the simulation aspect. We've relied on a lot of community support on the development of our drivers, on the development of our, uh, you know, uh, the entire uh, analysis approach that we've actually adopted. Uh, we've, we've gone about this approach because fixes were a lot faster. We were able to resolve uh, new systems that uh, that we were trying to employ on a space mission that was earlier not an application before. So we could see a lot of ground application on the softwares, on the open source softwares, but uh, since there was a massive community support, we were able to do a lot of uh, improvement on that basis, the fixes uh, that existed for that, a really quick turnaround. So that's an observation that helped, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, that helped us adopt uh, open source systems at uh, at the beginning of the mission itself, so so that's that's something that we observed. <coughs> so uh, uh, we've we've of course uh, relied on uh, open source uh, OSs for our implementation. There were some uh, payable and proprietary uh, softwares that came in. Uh, some of the areas where uh, proprietary softwares came in was in the area of designing and simulation and uh, uh, and and uh, you know the development softwares, the the system development softwares on the avionics, on let's say uh, the CAD aspect. So there we had to rely on some of the payable and proprietary softwares. <coughs> so just to give you an idea of all the resources that has gone in, so we've uh, we've relied on uh, you know a lot of RF tools that come in, things like Splat. Uh, Lenaro's been a crucial, uh, you know, OS for uh, our rover systems. GMAT's been one of a, one of the crucial tools that uh, that you know pushed us uh, towards ensuring that our mission analysis is correct. You don't, you know, you don't launch it up and always check out if it's if it's really correct or not. You need to rely on one software or the other. So we need, we adopted a an, a procedure in which. Uh, we were comparing and validating two softwares versus each other. That that really that's an approach that really helped us out in ensuring our calculations are correct. Because this, uh, just to give you an idea, this is something that's um, being attempted uh, for one of the first times in the country. So you don't exactly get uh, inputs on this ASAP. You need to figure out or devise methods to do this. So we we relied on GMAT very heavily on our uh, you know you know mission analysis uh, aspect <coughs> of course for software management for uh, um, for for uh, let's say uh, you know 
even inventory or asset management. We've relied on, uh, on, on certain software tools pretty heavily. Uh, just to give you an idea, some of the other resources that you see here, uh, these were tools that, uh, that weren't necessarily open source, but these were certain proprietary tools that, um, that enabled us to begin with. So these, this is sort of like a list down of <laughs> all the tools that we, we sort of employed on our system. So these were heavy duty tools that you know, we keep using every day. These are the engines of our, uh, of our, uh, of our entire design, simulation, and development. Uh, background so yeah that's these 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 help help us pretty massively and yeah just to walk you through the other aspects of our mission really really quickly uh, we have uh, something called the orbiter to moon so that's that's an endeavor where a lot of these tools get applied um, we we have these uh, these these uh, experiments that actually get tested uh, near the lunar surface <coughs> now there's uh, there's a little uh, you know experimentation that goes on there's a lot of there's a little bit of science that goes on in this mission and those are the ones that are devised and designed by uh, by the kids out there uh, kids younger than the age of around 25 uh, we what you see here are their concept ideas you know the ones that they made to just tell us what they're trying to do and finally we shortlisted around eight teams that are actually going to test their experiments on, on the uh, lunar surface. Experiments like cyanobacteria testing, uh, radiation testing, uh, uh, you know, uh, effects of, uh, of charged particles uh, on the lunar surface. So kids made those experiments and those are little 250 gram soda can bottles, soda can size experiments that are going on on our, uh, on our system. Yeah. Thank you. I'm ready for any questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Guru. I think uh, uh, we have a quick question here. That's very nice. Thanks for the intro to Team Indus. That's, that's really exciting. Um, one question. You explained how you rely on open source software. What about the actual flight software that will run on either the lander or the other things, and the hardware too? Yeah, so for, uh, for the, let's say, the lander software, we're using proprietary uh, tools for that. But let's say for the rover systems, uh, where you need to rely on miniaturized uh, you know, hardware, uh, not, not the standard off the shelf, not, not like the standard space grade systems on that, uh, things that we up end, up, end up up screening there, there uh, we're relying on uh, open source OSs to actually support us. So, so if you saw, Linaro's uh, been a major, uh, you know, uh, major implementation on on our uh, on our side. Yeah. On that. Uh, again, I understand the, the concept of open source in terms of you know the rely the, what you rely on, but the actual code that you're going to be writing on it. That's my question. Yeah. So you're asking the actual code would that be open source or not? Yeah. So so that's that's an aspect that we've been exploring very heavily. And uh, I think uh, there's a big scope for making a lot of that, uh, you know, freely available or, or openly available uh, to, to the open source community. I think there's, there's a lot of scope for that. I think we can just, you know, uh, the teams working on that have debated and discussed that and arrived at some conclusions on that pretty massively. So I think once we launch a lot of, a lot of data products are also getting generated. So. Uh, it's not just the code that, that runs the rover, but there's a lot of information set. There's a lot of data set that's being generated on the surface, uh, which has a scope for you know, becoming available for usage pretty massively. I feel open data is coming up then. OK. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> do we have another question over there? Um, just one quick question. So you gave an overview of the kinds of tools, open source tools that you're using, but can you maybe talk a little bit, especially as a private company, on your strategy to give back to the community? And it touches maybe on the topic that you were just mentioning. So do you have a governance policy uh, on, you know, we take so much out of the community, this is what we give back? Or is it incidental, you know, an engineer decides I want to license this open source and they ask a manager? What is kind of the internal strategy to participate rather than you know just use open source 
Um, so, so you're asking about the process internally that we would be having. So I think the standard processes uh, for making it open source would be there. All the stakeholders involved in making that, that software would be coming into picture. Um, we're a private, uh, we're, we're a private entity on this. So, so the policies would be, uh, let's say, governed by the internal, uh, you know, internal policy that we adopt on this. But what I see here is again in lines of uh, what what I was just asked on the, on the code code aspect itself. Uh, major aspects of it would be made open source, and I think, uh, of course, we need to arrive at a firmed up policy on that internally. Uh, but uh, what I see here is a lot of scope on making that uh, available back to the community because we got all of this. A lot of segment segments in our development came from the uh, you know open source tools and open source um, you know support available community support available. So uh, it's our responsibility to you know make that happen. Hi, um, you talked a lot of what you are going to send up. How will your crown segment look like? Yeah, um, again, so ground soft, the ground segment is again a mixture of both proprietary as well as, uh, you know, um, open source uh, systems being employed. Um, I mean, maybe I could give you an overview of that uh, once, once we're just discussing that one to one, uh, but there are different uh, aspects being, being made yeah. on that. I think some of the tools also get you know, doubled up on the ground systems also. Yeah. Okay. The, there's also a, a social impact you have. Uh, if we forgot all about this, kind um, of giving inspiration all around. Yeah. So uh, great. <laughs> so we we do have a uh, a big uh, you know connect with the people, um, the kids basically uh, from from the non-urban regions. Uh, let's say uh, the rural areas, the city, the the the, the villages. Uh, so those those are areas where we we try to inculcate a lot of science in them because we see a lot of kids not getting access to any of this, uh, any of the stuff that we're talking about. They don't even add, even have an idea about you know what goes on other than the fact that space is just about a rocket going up in the sky. So we're so so we're we're educating kids about uh, about science, bringing in STEM. Uh, you know, to their uh, to their understanding, teaching them about. There's a bus that goes around uh, across the country where we're actually showing them, um, you know, videos of uh, of uh, or in fact catching reception from from a satellite, uh, showing them how the weather actually looks like, how the weather, you know, uh, how that how that really gets received. There's an antenna system. All, all, all those those basic fundamental aspects. So that's something that we've we've been doing that through a bus uh, as part of the Team and Us uh, Foundation. Uh, that's that's going around. So that's that's one one area. Uh, we've also uh, tried to implement as much as you know uh, as much as open source tools uh, on the foundation aspect also. Yeah. Thank you very much, Guru. If you have any more questions, you can talk with Guru. He's going to be here the two days. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. We can thank, you. thank you. So uh, this is it for the welcome session. We have uh, right now starting the first session of the day. Uh, it will be, uh, well, it was a pleasure to, to chair this one. And it will be a pleasure to, to have uh, Elena uh, chairing the following. She, she's been a uh, space travel operator in, uh, operation engineer on uh, on ExoMars here. Speak on. <laughs> speak on. Uh, yeah. well, uh, sorry, uh, speak on, not speak on. And, uh, and now you work at UMASAT, right? Yes. Yeah. So, hi, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity for us all to share some opinions and maybe something more since share is the key point of all this meeting. And I think you all know uh, why we are here today, but uh, I'd like to mention that um, someone said that for me open source is a moral thing. So I think this is, um, this is a moral thing, this is our responsibility also to start sharing what we know. And we are in the place where missions come alive, that's what they say, 
that's what they do here. But I'd like also to say that uh, we are in the place where teamwork is the key to success, because none of these would be possible, uh, what we are um, experiencing in those buildings, uh, without teamwork, without cooperation, without people working together. So um, let me now welcome our, our first speaker. This session is about mission analysis and astrodynamics. And I'd like to welcome on stage Helge Heisor, and he is uh, working at Telespazio Vega, but he has also been a research assistant, and he was a freelancer here at ESOC, so you may know some people already. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Elena, for the kind introduction. And I'm really excited to be here, and also mildly terrified to be opening this first session. And um, as we already heard, mission analysis is important to get your mission off the ground, to have a successful mission. So I think it's quite fitting that we're starting with that. And um, I am here as well today because I'm a firm believer in open source and um, in democratizing the access to space and to the exploration of space. So, I will talk to you about my framework for mission analysis, uh, which is called astrodynamics.jl. And in the beginning, I want to share some insight into how this project came to be, which brings me to my initial question, which is, what implicit assumptions are holding us back? So, what do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. So, this is what I call the holy trinity of orbital rocket design. So the perfect orbital rocket should, of course, be able to deliver a signif significant payload to orbit. Uh, it should not break the bank, and it should be mostly reusable. And, um, well, for the longest time, we all knew that out of these three, you had to choose two. So, for example, you could design a cheapish um, orbital rocket like, uh, like Vega, but then, of course, it would be completely expendable. Then uh, the space shuttle, mostly reusable, able to reach orbit, but an economic disaster. Or something small, completely, basically infinitely reusable, like New Shepard, but uh, those are suborbital rockets, no, not, not really going up there. Well, um, I think you know how the story ends. This guy happened. And what, what Elon Musk did is he showed us that you can, in fact, have all those three if you are willing to question your assumptions, if you are willing to reason from first principles. And, um, well, in my opinion, the situation in astrodynamics was similar. So, the holy trinity of astrodynamics applications. It should be fast because it's compu computationally intensive. Um, the software tool should be easily extensible because of the ever-changing requirements of space missions. And um, it should also be interactive because many analyses, uh, they well, they start in an exploratory way. You don't really know in the beginning where you'll end up, so you would want to do that in an interactive way. So what can you do? You could write your application in a compiled language like C++, Fortran or Java which would certainly be fast and also easily and extensible for some definitions of easy. Uh, I mean, there are people that claim that they know how Java build systems work. Uh, I'm not sure I believe them. Or you could use a dynamic language like MATLAB or Python. So it would definitely be interactive. It would also be easily extensible, but the performance might not be that great. So what could you do? You could start with a dynamic language and uh, then rewrite hotspots in a static language, like writing a MEX file. Who, who of you has, has written a MEX file? Who are uh, so free people? Who enjoyed it? That's what I thought. Another approach is taking your C++ or Fortran core and wrapping that in a nice fancy GUI like GMAT or SDK do. But um, 
well, let's be honest, it's an ast ast astronomic effort and um, it's even more painful to extend. So, around two years ago, Juan Luis Cano, who will be talking next, and I uh, asked ourselves, is this still true? And what we did was, we co-authored a, stu uh, um, a study for the International uh, Conference on Astronomics Tools and Techniques here in Darmstadt in 2016, where we implemented four classical astronomics problems. So calculating the capillarian elements, solving Kepler's equation, solving Lambert's problem, and finally uh, calling legacy code, so calling a, a Fortran 77 integrator. And we did all that in six programming languages, in Fortran, C++, Java, MATLAB, Python, and Julia. So what were the results? What you see here on the y-axis, we, we start with the y-axis, is the significant lines of code with respect to Fortran. So Fortran is here, which means that everybody who's below this line is less verbose than Fortran, which is basically par for the course, unless you are Java. And now uh, to the x-axis, which is average runtime with respect to Fortran. And please lo note this, this is a log scale. So um, what was actually a bit su or quite surprising, or maybe not that surprising, our hunch was correct, that almost everybody is very close to Fortran, so within one order of magnitude. Uh, well, except MATLAB, that's sad. We're not talk much about MATLAB. So, how is this possible, you ask? Because those are dynamic languages, Julia and Python, they're supposed to be slow. But the magic ingredient is just-in-time compilation. So, Julia by default and Python through an extension are able to compile functions at runtime to native code, which makes them able to run at speeds of Fortran or C++. So I said to myself, this Julia thing, that sounds really exciting. I'm going all in on that. So another fitting title for this talk would have been How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the JIT, the Just-in-Time Compiler. So let's talk a bit about Julia. What is it? It's a high-level, high-performance dynamic programming language and was initially developed at MIT and has recently been spun out into the Julia Computing startup. It has a comprehensive standard library for technical computing and a rapidly growing ecosystem. Um, for example, best-in-class differential equation integrators. And what I find really interesting is that, um, the so the first version was actually released in 2012, and since then the language, so the core language, has attracted more than 600 individual contributors, including me, which is uh, probably due to the fact that most of Julia is actually written in Julia, so the barrier to entry is very low. You could uh, you familiarize yourself with the language and you could get hacking on the core language within a few days. So, Julia in one sentence, looks like MATLAB with a heavy dose of Python but runs like Fortran. The current version is 0 0.6, so not stable yet but the next version will be 1.0, so the first stable release, and it's right around the corner. Feature freeze will actually be on December 15. On top of this foundation, I built my framework for mission analysis. Um, it started out like experimenting with the language and uh, then turned into a proof of concept for my PhD thesis, and I would say that the current status is well, a minimum viable product, um, an MVP. It's licensed uh, under the Mo Mozilla public license and freely available on, on GitHub, so please, please check it out. What's in there yet? So right now, um, we're going, we'll, we'll be going through this laundry list. So I've implemented time scale and reference frame conversions, uh, high, high performance ephemerates based on uh, SPK kernels from, from JPL, semi-analytical and numerical propagation with event detection, 
And I'm currently working on I.O., so writing uh, CCSDS files, so orbit data messages, and writing spice kernels, um, actual trajectory optimization, and um, this is another cool thing about Julia. You can actually, from the command line, call any other language which has a C-compatible API. So um, C, C++, Fortran, Python, and I'm uh, now integrating third-party propagators, so for example, Orokit or uh, GMAT, which we already heard about, into my framework. And of course, I validated the results, and for that I used industry standards like Orokit, again, GMAT, and SPICE. So, since uh, 12 minutes are not that long, I'm not going to show you code, but I would like to talk about my design goals instead. So, um, if it's not clear already, I care about performance. So, uh, performance should be competitive with Fortran solutions. The thing should be extensible at runtime. So, um, well, you should basically be able to write a complete force model on the command line and it should run in the same speed like the stuff um, that are already part of the library. The API should be for humans. Um, I mean, six character function names, which might have been cool with Fortran 77, it's not good enough anymore. It should be well documented, of course. And, um, okay, the last one is a stretch goal. It should make SDK obsolete. So, um, finally, I'm uh, filling out my own report card, so this is good. High performance, uh, the benchmarks are very promising, so I'm giving myself a happy Elon. Is it extensible at runtime? Yes, it is. Uh, as I said, you can type a force model on the, on the Julia command line and it will run with the same native speed. So, another happy Elon. API for humans, um, please approach me during the demo sessions and I'll show you what, you, what I mean by that, but um, I think I've achieved that goal as well. And uh, documentation. Uh, yeah, I'm not there yet, so this is more Exploding Falcon 9 than Happy Elon. <laughs> and uh, about making SDK obsolete, well, as I said, it's a stretch goal. So, finally, an open source project doesn't, doesn't do much, it's not very useful if uh, it doesn't, if it has just one developer and one user, uh, right now, so that's me. Um, meaning, I want to involve you. So the question is, what can I do to help you get your mission off the ground? And with that I say, thank you very much for your attention. And um, please have a look at my stuff on GitHub. Thank you, Elga. So, question time? Yes. Wait. Great uh, presentation. Um, and I can empathize with your problems. I started two open source astronomics toolboxes slash libraries. Um, and so what I've actually noticed having gone to ICAT and a few other events around the world is a lot of people have this idea, a lot of mission analysts have this idea, but we're all creating our own open source libraries. So I was wondering if you can comment if you've thought on how do we pool all of this together knowing that you know there's various languages to support, various features, and there is a lot of stuff also being developed in parallel now as open source, but it's maybe less useful when you have one developer indeed on every one of those libraries instead of a more meta open source approach. So do you have any thoughts on coordination or how to bring this together? Very good question, I think. Um, unfortunately, there's, well, as you notice, there's no, there's no easy answer. What, what I decided for myself is I want to, um, I want to reuse stuff. So uh, this made, made Julia very attractive because I can directly call Java, I can directly call C. So um, even if I just use it for validation, uh, it's very good to stand on the shoulders of giants and uh, use the stuff that's already out there. In terms of coordination, well, it's a bit of a chicken-egg problem. Uh, you, have to, you have to start somewhere. 
And um, what what I didn't notice, uh, what I didn't put in my slides, what I want to what I want to mention is that my employer is actually interested in funding this project. Interested, they didn't agree on it yet. So um, this might happen, and um, we would like to put the software out there for for comment from a bio, uh, from a wider community. And um, I mean that's the beauty of open source; you can always work together, even if it's just taking bits and pieces of existing projects. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the very interesting uh, talk. Uh, two comments. Uh, one uh, is I would like to challenge you on the on the Java uh, verbosity because I think it's a little bit uh, a little bit uh, far fetched that uh, Java is so much more verbose than other languages because uh, if you are using modern tools you will have probably like 500 lines of code but you will only hand code like 10 of them so it's a little bit uh, uh, unfair comparison I think and the second uh, comment is that. Uh, it's very nice to have a language like Julia, but uh, you, you will have find it very hard times to, to find uh, contributors uh, able to, to code in, 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 in this language. Okay, so about the Java, I agree, it was not a fair comparison because the example uh, was actually calling GNI, so it was a lot of C and Java code um, point taken. But uh, as I'm fond of saying, programming languages is a bit like religion. Um, everybody has their taste, and you can get into holy wars very quickly. So um, let's do that over beer. And uh, about Julia, this is um, I would I would say this is a misconception. Just because a language is not very popular, that you're not able to get developers, because the people actually working with the languages are usually enthusiasts and they are, um, so they're probably also quite good because they use their free time to get into that. And um, also concerning Julia in particular, well, as I said, it looks like MATLAB. So everyone who has used MATLAB in their studies uh, or is used to a language like MATLAB or Python can get into Julia very quickly. Well, I was able to, so I don't see that uh, as much as an imp impediment. Questions? Other questions? Yeah. Well, okay. Hi, my name is Laksh. Um, I just wanted to ask you whether you have a uh, visualization model already on your uh, code, like something along the lines of what SDK does, because a lot of times when you uh, crunch all the numbers, then you get a huge number and nobody except you understands what it means. So you have to show the investors and everybody else. So do you have something like that on this or are you planning to work on that eventually? Yes, <laughs> not, not public. And um, so what I, what I have in the library right now is uh, basic 3D plotting. And uh, what I'm also currently finishing is an, S an, an export to Cosmographia. I don't know if you know that tool, it's, uh, uh, it's not open source, but it's a free tool from JPL, which does very nice visualizations, so you can directly import the trajectory from my tool into Cosmographia. Cool. Other questions? Good, then I take the opportunity. <laughs> uh, I'm a huge uh, Python fan, and so far what you have said kind of sounds to me uh, like Python. Uh, easy of language, okay, the, the speed is maybe something, but there's this number, NumPy, no, uh, there's a library to make the things faster. Um, but one advantage I see is that uh, you have this rich ecosystem around Python. So I know Julia, I don't know much about Julia, but I heard it from Flight Dynamics because uh, some of them, they're interested in using it. Um, but with Python, you cover basically everything. You can do plotting, you can uh, uh, interactive stuff. Now you even have it for micro for microcontrollers, so micro Python. So question is, how can you convince me as a Python developer to do something in Julia? What's the benefit for me? So first, you don't need to, because I can use your stuff uh, from Julia, even if it's Python. So for example, um, of course, you know Matplotlib. So um, Matplotlib is completely integrated into Julia, so uh, one of one of the big plotting libraries. And um, I mean, it, the problem is it probably boils down to a matter of taste. 
But uh, what I found for myself, because uh, before I got started with Julia, I was a uh, full blood Pythonista, and I still have a, s a soft spot in my heart for it. <laughs> but what I found out that I, when I use Julia, I get better software designs. The the thing is, is it's not classical object orientation. It's a um, it's called multiple dispatch, the programming paradigm. And as I said, it's taste. So I get better designs out of it. And um, I, I had an uh, I have a slide for that, but not here. Uh, the problem in Python for me is uh, is optimization. It's like a complicated flowchart. You start with your code, and if it's not fast enough, then you decide, uh, okay, I use NumPy arrays. But then it's only works well if it's vectorized. So if it's math code, you go the number way. But number doesn't work with closures, for example. And uh, then uh, if it's not math code, well, you, you could use Cython, but this is well, just another thing, and then you are at the end of the flowchart, and you're saying, "Okay, it's still slow. Okay, I'm rewrite it, and I'll, I'll rewrite it in Fortran." I, I'm not saying that it's bad; it's just more complicated. And Julia, you take Julia code, you do your optimizations from the prototype you had in the beginning, all in the same language, and in the end, it will be as fast as C. So for me, this is a plus. Okay. Well, thank you, Olga. Um, we run out of time. Uh, I would have asked you another question, but uh, we will do it offline. Um, yeah, thank you. And thanks. Let me now welcome on the stage Juan Luis Cano. Uh, so they do know each other. <laughs> uh, they have worked together, as Helga said. And he's a aeronautical engineer and a software developer at, uh, at Satellogic. And uh, he will present some uh, study about polyastro and astrodynamic library written in Python. So, welcome. You're rich. Not talking about Julia, not anymore. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for two reasons. First, to organize this wonderful event about open source software and hardware in space, which I think it was very necessary, and I'm glad to see this is a bold uh, uh, movement in this. And also for putting my talk earlier in the morning so I can relax for the rest of the event and enjoy <laughs> the rest of the presentations. So my name is Juan Luis Cano. And this, not, this talk is not about me, it's about this project, so I'm going to talk about Polyastro, an astrodynamics library written in Python. Um, a first introduction of what Polyastro is, is a pure Python library for astrodynamics. I'm going to touch some of the topics that LG already mentioned regarding performance and other things. Uh, it has ba basic uh, core astrodynamics uh, algorithms implemented that you are going to see because I'm going to show a lot of code. Uh, it has very cool documentation, so I recommend you to check it out. And version 0 0.8 was released uh, some days ago. I got it the OSCW edition, so I recommend you to check the release notes as well. And it's released under the um, MIT license, so it's permissive and it's commercial friendly. And I would love to have it used in, in some private companies or whatever. A little bit of history, I don't want to get uh, very deep into this, but this started four years ago as a university project. I had a bunch of MATLAB and Fortran algorithms that I had to put together, and uh, I used Python for gluing all that code together, and it worked, but it was only known to work in my computer because it was impossible to install anywhere else. And two years later, I rewrote all the Fortran and MATLAB code in Python using Numba, which I'm going to mention in a minute. And so I threw away all the Fortran code that made me a happy man and made Polyastro possible to install on Windows. Uh, last year, well, this year, sorry, I had some funding from the European Space Agency in a program that is called the Summer of Code in Space, which is similar to the Google Summer of Code but for space-related projects, that was very nice because I had a student working for three months on some of the features, and that was really a boost for the project. Well, why another astrodynamics library, or how does it compare to the alternatives or the competence? Uh, well, I, I'm sure you already know Orekit, which is the Java library that, uh, that we all love, but for my taste, it's too restricted on Earth 
oriented problems, uh, probably for commercial reasons, and I wanted something that is more general that can uh, analyze interplanetary orbits and, I don't know, solar systems that are yet to be discovered, as some of the users have been telling me lately. And also, I, I have zero knowledge about Java, so I didn't want to get there. And also, s the SPICE toolkit from NASA, uh, well, this is very professional, it is open, it's maintained by NASA, so it's very good, and if you want to do some serious business, uh, you really have to do it to use it. But I wanted to make something that is more lightweight, more uh, fit for my, for my taste, maybe easier for students to pick it up, and also use Python for everything. Well, as I told you, I'm going to uh, show you a little bit of code. I assume that uh, many of you know Python. Can you raise your hand? Okay, that's nice. And who are using Python on a daily basis? Not so, not so many. Okay, when, when I presented this in ACAT last year, uh, many people approached me and told me, you know, Python is very cool, but it's my language for the weekends. So I expect that this can be a gentle introduction to what you can do with Python in Astrodynamics and maybe contribute to the project. So uh, you can, the first thing that you see when you use Polyastro is that you can use it interactively on an interface that's called the Jupyter Notebook, which is actually what I use to create these slides and what I'm going to so show you when we go to the demo time in the afternoon. Uh, it handles physical units and astronomical time scales uh, very nicely, thanks to one of the dependencies that's called AstroPy. Uh, some Mars missions maybe enjoyed this physical unit handling in the past, maybe too late. Uh, and it covers some of the algorithms that I'm going to show you now. So this is uh, some sample code that you can write in Polyastro. So this is all the lines that are needed to create one orbit one uh, Keplerian orbit, so you specify the position and the velocity in kilometers and kilometers per second, and then you get an orbit object that you can manipulate, you can get the epoch uh, in uh, the appropriate time scale, you can convert the position and velocity to the Keplerian elements and show them in degrees or in radians or whatever. And you also have simple visualizations in two dimensions, like this one, which is just projecting the orbit in the plane of the orbit with the x-axis towards the eccentricity vector. And you also have some nice 3D visualizations thanks to another library that is, that is called Plotly. As you can see, with only one line of code, you can visualize this. Uh, these are static slides in uh, PDF, but in the demo session, I can show you that this is interactive and you can rotate the view and zoom in, and zoom out, and stuff like that. Other thing that is very interesting in Polyastro is that you can interface to external data sources. Uh, most of this work was done by this student uh, with the Summer of Code in Space program. So the first thing you can interface with is the uh, ephemerides files from the JPL uh, that gives you the position and the velocity of the problems with very, very good accuracy. So using AstroPy, if you just set the latest JPL uh, ephemerides, then you can get all the position and velocity of the planets either uh, sampling the true velocity and positions over a period of time or just getting the osculating orbit as you can see here. And the other two things that are very nice also relating to the talk that Rolf Densing was uh, doing this morning, relating to the near-Earth objects and the space uh, awareness and all that. All that. Uh, you can interface to two um, uh, services that give you uh, data about near-Earth objects. The, one, the first one is a uh, web interface that is just connecting to an uh, REST API to get the data of the orbit, for instance, about the Florence asteroid that passed uh, near the Earth uh, at the beginning of September. I have a very good tutorial on how to handle all this data. And also uh, a binary database that is called DASCOM5 that holds many, many of the asteroids and comets that you might know. And it has the, the addition that you can get many different periods of a known object. So for instance, you can get the Halley orbit as it was observed in 1835, for instance. And this is the code that you would need to plot all the inner planetary system and the Florence asteroid and the Halley comet. So as you can see, it's very easy with a very nice API. And you can handle all of this as, uh, as any any native Python plotting object. Uh, some, uh, some words about the core algorithms that I'm implementing. Uh, we have analytical propagation using 
the universal variables approach that is found on Batin. Uh, I will comment on that a bit later on, but it's not working really well for some cases. Uh, we have numerical propagation using the Cobos method, so you can specify any uh, custom acceleration, um, the Lambert's problem, and also some orbital maneuvers. Let me go to the code. Well, the propagation has nothing fancy into it. You have some uh, orbit object, and then you propagate some time in time, or uh, you select the final date of the orbit, and then you can retrieve all the orbits, all the properties of the orbit that you might want. Regarding numerical propagation, this is a very nice example. For instance, I'm defining here a constant acceleration that is tangent to the velocity, and if you plot here, uh, sorry, if you propagate this here, uh, giving this acceleration uh, from a sample orbit and a callback to store the results, then you get this beautiful spiral orbit plot uh, in 3D that, that, as I mentioned before, you can rotate and stuff like that. Uh, you also have the Lambert problem computation. That is what I presented at ICAT last year. So it's using the ITSO algorithm developed here in the uh, advanced concept teams of ISA uh, that supports multiple revolution. So you just pass the uh, initial uh, position and the final position and the time of flight, and you get the velocities that you have to develop at the beginning and the final velocity at the end. And also some simple orbital maneuvers like uh, the transfer with the Hohmann, the Hohmann transfer, sorry, uh, the B-elliptic transfer and stuff like that. As you can see, it's all everything, very few lines of code, and uh, you have uh, interactive um, visualization of the results as you are seeing them. And this is, for instance, a plot of all the intermediate stages of a, a Hohmann transfer. Uh, regarding the performance, uh, um, the results that we presented last year at ICAT uh, were these ones. So I implemented the ITSO algorithm, as I told you, and I compared it to one implementation that I found out there uh, written in Fortran, and I compiled it with two different compilers, and I compared everything to the performance of the Intel compiler. So what I have is that the Intel Fortran compiler is the best, as we expected. Then I have the GNU G Fortran compiler. And the last row is the pure Python algorithm without any additions. And in the middle, we have the Python plus Numba, which is a Python library that does just-in-time compiling, as LJ was mentioning before. And of course, I don't get the full performance of the Fortran, but it's decent enough uh, to, OK, be fast, but not that much. I'm saving many, many lines of code at the little cost of performance. Uh, some words about the future work, less than two minutes, I promise. Um, I, w I studied some continuous thrust maneuvers and optimal transfers as part of my final thesis, so I want to include that in the library and also some orbital perturbations such as solar pressure, atmospheric drag, and stuff like that. I would like to make some improvements on the propagation and also make better validation because so far I'm using uh, textbook assignments or results from some papers, but it's difficult to find, uh, you know, data about complex examples or complex uh, propagations and stuff like that. So I will have to validate it against SPICE or SDK or something like that. And of course, I need contributors as any open source project. Uh, so far, I've been mostly the only contributor, but uh, this year, thanks to the ESA funding, I had another one, and I'm having some minor contributions here and there. But I would love to have you to contribute either easy things or complicating things as, as soon as you want. So um, still, I'm already running out of time, but uh, the conclusions are here. Polyestro offers an attractive and interactive uh, API. There's lots of visualization. I'm focusing a lot of documentation. There's uh, still a lot of work to do, but I would love to have some contributors because this is already big too big for one person to handle. So this is the link for the slides. You can uh, connect with me in LinkedIn. I will be here around the, uh, the full conference. So please talk to me, say hello, uh, say how do you want to contribute. And I hope you enjoyed this talk and I will be happy to accept any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Luis. And uh, so I might have a question. It's like, uh, do you guys interact? Do you argue? Is he trying to convince you to <laughs> get to 
to well, Julia or <laughs> I'm glad that you are asking me this question. The answer is no, because uh, we don't have to argue between open source uh, communities. We get on well. The Python and the Julia community get on well. I think there's a lot of overlap on what we can do. Of course, we would love all to have one solution for everything, but everybody has their own assumptions and their own requirements and their own, I don't know, and we want to spend our free time on what we like. So I think it's nice that LJ is working in the Julia uh, library, that I'm working in the Python counterpart, and uh, that we find ways to contribute in the future, but uh, work uh, in whatever we want. Yeah, thank you. So any question from the audience? Um, I was just uh, wondering whether, well, the original question I was going to ask, you just answered. But uh, the second question has to do with, so I see a lot of, let's say, hobbyists or people in their free time, or if they get explicit permission from their employer, developing mission analysis, open source software. It seems to be like the hobby of choice uh, for most uh, space engineers. Um, but I was wondering whether you, you see any traction for, let's say, actual space missions to start using tools like Polyastro. I know ORCID, for instance, got adopted through a governance model um, for actual mission use. Um, is that anywhere in your ambition for this roadmap? Or are you looking at it mostly as, OK, hey, this is a fun side project hobby that opens up access you know, to astrodynamics? Or, or do you actually see sort of in the roadmap it becomes a formalized tool? Yes. Well, thank you very much for the question. I think it's a very good one. Um, so far, Polyastro has been used by some universities to do university projects or assignments. Uh, in Pakistan, there's one university that's it's using it to make the textbook uh, and using it for the examples, which I think is very nice. I have a testimonials page, by the way, in the documentation. Um, but I think uh, the power of this library is in keeping the focus uh, very clear, and my focus is on having something that is that works for preliminary analysis. So you have, like, I don't know, the Lambert problem, and you have uh, some propagation and stuff like that, but you don't have like uh, the very, uh, very, very good accuracy or very um, complex propagators that you might find in other in other solutions. So I think I'm still, well, re uh, asking your question. I would love to see this used for professional missions and commercial missions and stuff like that, but only for the stage of when you are, uh, I don't know, optimizing the orbit or visualizing or getting to know how are you going to do the flybys and stuff like that. And yes, that's it. Uh, maybe a comment on this. Um, I mean, if you do a project uh, or if a company is going to do a project, then uh, they will pay you to do the coding and so on. So there's the motivation to get the money. <laughs> but uh, if you do this on your own, then it's really just your, your vision or your, your idea. And I think if you want to get other people on board, then you really have to, the challenge is to get others motivated. In particular, if you work remotely in other parts of the world and just communicate over internet, the challenge is really to keep this thing going on. And in my experience, I find it quite easy to do coding by myself. But when it comes to integrate other people, that's a big challenge. And I think that's what you are doing right now. To you want to create a, a community around Polyastro. So the question is maybe to the audience, does anybody have experience in forming a community that is contributing? Because you have challenges like documenting and uh, you know getting people on the right track that they understand what, what's the vision, what's the goal. Is there anybody who has this experience in setting up a community? Yes, it's difficult. So obviously we have Libre Space Foundation. Um, yeah, I'll give you the microphone. So do you have um, also people from outside of Greece? Uh, I mean, yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, not to go into much detail about community building because that can be a workshop by itself, obviously. Um, but I think that the main aspects are um, to really have a hard thinking and hard thoughts on what are the common grounds among different existing communities, because communities are out there, right? Like there's Python packaging communities. There are people that are doing testing. There are people that are doing 
um, you know, all sorts of other things, specifically around you know your project. And I think that the the key there would be to incentivize people to find what they want in the project rather than what the overall aspect of the project would be. So, for example, like for testing your library, like if you are you know, to form an alliance with um, an existing community that is building a new testing framework and just actually, you know, tapping into that, then that would excite them and get you get them going on, on that. I mean, that's at least what we, we've done up until now with LibreSpace Foundation and our projects. Like, we're trying to find, you know, neighboring communities and excite them about their own, you know, focus and their own scope uh, and then get them to, to contribute to the projects. If I have one second to, some seconds to uh, say some words about that. Um, actually, I'm spending a lot of time in documentation, in community building, and outreach, and stuff like that. And this year, the PolyAstro project m uh, started to be part of the AstroPy community, which is more astronomy focused, but we are still, well, we have a lot of overlap, especially regarding reference frames and stuff like that. And we are also part of the Open Astronomy Initiative, which is also uh, uh, covering the Julia Astro part, so I totally agree with you that you have we have to uh, look for common ground uh, between communities, and that is only one of the parts of getting people on board. And the other thing I would say is having very very good documentation, uh, having issues that are easy for beginners. Ha do some mentoring, look for funding because students maybe don't have the p the time or the resources to contribute, but maybe you can pay them sometimes and then get them on board or something. So there's lots of things to discuss about how to sustain open source. Good. Any other question? Okay, coming. <laughs> And you, you mentioned workgroups, so this would be a good topic for a workgroup on how to build this uh, community. So uh, I'll say up front, this is not a question, but a comment on the on what you said. I th just want to drive this point home, but I, because I think it's really important that you see where are overlaps in different domains. So um, for my project, it was uh, very beneficial to split out parts which can be used by astronomy projects, which are not astronomic specific. So at the beginning, it was one monolith. Everything was my responsibility. And um, now, uh, for example, I took the timescale conversions and uh, will in the, in the coming year split out the reference frames because this is something that uh, astronomers also need and astrophysicists. So think about where are the, the, the synergies. Thank you. So, Good. thanks uh, to Juan Luis. Thank you. Thank you. And now, let us welcome on the stage uh, Boris Segre, uh, who is a research engineer and he runs uh, and operates a space center, CSERS. Um, and he will talk about docks at the Paris Observatory Center. Thank you, Elena. So at first I'd like to say that, uh, so uh, in my opinion, uh, open source uh, it should not, shall not be a fight against uh, propri proprietary license. It should be a mean to uh, to hire the level, the quality level of paid software in order to make a new baseline of what should not be sold. So. With free software, with open source, we bring something new at the level of what, is sh what should be free, and then we push STK or MATLAB or anyone, uh, anybody we want to make more than that. So that's in, in my, my, my opinion, not, not making them uh, destroy. Well, okay, so DOCS, DOCS is an attempt to contribute to the open source uh, effort. Uh, well, I would say will be an attempt. So let me tell you what is a Paris Observatory, how Paris Observatory is involved in that. And uh, first to acknowledge my co-author. So I came here with Sébastien Durand, who is here. So we'll have a demo and you can talk uh, with uh, uh, both of us. But I'd like also to acknowledge the contributions, the early contributions of students, Nicolas Beauchard, Florent Joussaume, Guillaume Thébault, Zachary Barou-Dumont, Thomas Gascar, Haoshi Jim Lin from Taiwan, uh, and Benoît Mosser and Pierre Drossa are uh, my colleagues in, uh, in the CC Race uh, space, uh, space Center that I will talk about. So Paris Observatory is very familiar in building space instruments. We are building 
producing and delivering instruments for 50 years to space agencies like uh, ESA, CNES, JAXA, NASA. So we are involved in all space missions. Uh, but what is new for us is the CubeSat scale. And that's what we want to get involved into. So we created two, uh, two uh, we created a network, ESEP. ESEP is a network of space research laboratories. Uh, these, space, uh, these space research laboratories are made of uh, scientists. And they proposed a list of uh, projects. And some of these projects are supported by ESEP with money and with technical or engineering support. And then uh, we have an educational uh, course, OSAE, uh, which is an educational program at master's degree, uh, dedicated to space, uh, space uh, engineering, and that provides students, so manpower, for this project. But not only students, uh, so students are involved. And so ESEP and OSAE have merged into the Space Campus CCRS uh, that intends to promote the use of nanosatellites in scientific and technological CubeSats. So our goal is not to produce educational CubeSats, but to produce scientific CubeSats. So Pierre Drossard is the head uh, of uh, ESEP and of CCRS. Uh, Benoît Mosser is the head of education part, and I'm the head of the technological aspect in the so-called PSL Research University, uh, so we are the, the space pole. So I'm sorry for this long introduction, but uh, in France we, we love to have many, many institutions, so it's a complicated landscape. For us. So DOCS is here to help uh, teams that are not familiar with an mission analysis uh, to make quick prototyping of their missions, uh, and we'll see how it works. So in Paris Observatory, we also have a uh, we also already have an engineer room, engineering room that is called PROMES, where DOCS is used. Uh, we, have, uh, we are building uh, clean rooms and we, have also, uh, uh, we, we will have soon, very soon, a uh, ground station, UHF, VHF ground stations, operated from this building. So we also have uh, short, short videos, many short videos on the ESEP uh, website. I uh, encourage you to, to have a look. And uh, the last summer, in so uh, last summer we had our first, very first uh, engineering concurrent engineering campaign uh, with uh, docs and in the engineering room. So we have a very first feedback from uh, what is possible to do in in terms of uh, concurrent engineering. Uh, if you have questions, I will be able to to explain. Uh, but just to know that we are inspired by this feedback to build DOCS. So DOCS uh, is an aggregation of many, many, many tools and is also uh, following a process. So the process is inspired by the spiral model at ESA uh, concurrent, and, uh, concurrent Design Facility that some of you may know. And so we have a spreadsheet to, uh, to structure the top level requirements, so the scientific requirements, the top level requirements, then to try building a, a timelines, then to make a, a breakdown structure, work breakdown structure, then to make an early risk analysis and so on, and to iterate. DOCS is the GUI interface to many, many uh, tools that we will uh, uh, review now. And everything that is produced by DOCS uh, is intended to be displayed in VTS. Uh, and VTS is the v uh, is, uh, means the visualization tool for space data. That is a free software, uh, not open source, but free software uh, developed by CNES on the basis of Celestia, that I am sure you know. Uh, so it, it embeds a full version of Celestia and it is dedicated to, uh, to the visualization of space data. So, you, you so we, we decided not to do uh, the same. We decided to output everything in CCSDS format to VTS. So, uh, because this visualization tool does not produce any data, it only displays the results. So, first chapter of DOCS, it is to build trajectories. So we have three ways to build trajectories. The so-called module Easy Traj. So Easy Traj is based on Scilab with the um, SCNES uh, Celestial Library uh, Celest Lab, that is also free. 
and uh, so uh, we use it to compute easy Keplerian uh, problems. Uh, we have a second level of trajectory production that is Stella. It is another free software by Kness, so we don't redevelop that, we interface with it. It is uh, probably comparable to Orekit, uh, but I don't know uh, very well Orekit. So Stella is a very fine-tuned model for Earth orbit with all small perturbations that are known. And we have also our own um, celestial propagator, not dedicated to Earth orbit, dedicated to deep space, or also Earth orbit, uh, if you want. It is then in Python with the PyCAP library. And um, it is so deep space compatible with uh, two specificities, so three specificities. First specificity, it's uh, free. Second specificity, it's not a constant time step. And this is very important as soon as you talk about deep space uh, and flybys. So uh, you don't want to have uh, always the time same time step. So we have a runjekuta felberg algorithm uh, that is a, a flexible time step approach. And uh, and third aspect, we can add, and that's uh, I think the, the most powerful uh, potential of the of this propagator. We can add specific gravitational model, for instance, uh, the gravitational model of uh, Comet Shuryumov Gerasimenko, who uh, or Didymos or what you want. So complex gravitational model for proximity operations, and uh, so we develop that in partnerships with Lesia and IMCC, two labs of our network that are dedicated in uh, space geodesy. So, uh, so as I said, uh, we, we, um, we develop, we produce all data in a so-called uh, standard CCSDS format in order to be displayed by VTS. Second, uh, second chapter of DOGS, we produce quaternions. Uh, so quaternions, so it's not always it's not only a question of trajectories it's also a question of uh, being able to point and more and more so uh, in the past cubesats cubesats were uh, uh, not uh, were without adcs but uh, more and more they, they need adcs not only to detangle but also to point to make some uh, imaging or to uh, uh, to make some uh, radio transmission in s band so with a uh, directive and antenna so for this aspect, we are able to produce very early in the project uh, so-called easy quaternions. Uh, then you can study uh, the, the pointings uh, of your uh, instruments of your an uh, or your antenna. And uh, I must say that we uh, gave up with interfacing uh, with a, a full ADCS domain, uh, a full ADCS model, sorry, uh, at first, because uh, we had some model in Simulink, but it was not uh, it was not possible to dock it because it's a proprietary software. So we try to uh, approach this with a uh, with um, API uh, approach. So I have I'm r already running out of time. So third and fourth chapter of. Uh of DOCS is uh, to produce intervisibility data. So you can need intervisibility data uh, at least to know if you are in intervisibility with your ground stations, but also in order to, to assess how quick you are spinning. So if you are tracking your ground data with a slew rate that is over your ADCS capacity, then it's not good. Uh, so don't, don't, uh, don't rely on this mission profile. So this is in Scilab and Py Scilab. We also uh, have developed a module in electric power system for electric power system in Python. Okay, I go. There is another part that is not exactly in DOCS that is dedicated to the platform that is completely developed by CNES, IDM CIC. It's uh, not in free uh, domain because at the moment the interface is uh, with Microsoft Windows and Microsoft Office Excel interfaced uh, to IDM, but you can produce uh, a 3DS model. So what is the roadmap of, uh, of DOCS? Uh, at the moment, we have a, a big virtual machine that can be run so in Ubuntu, that can be run in a Windows environment, uh, either with a virtual box or with a VMware that are free. And uh, but it's a monolithic uh, system with everything you need inside. So it's a bit uh, heavy, uh, 80, 18 gigabytes. So we cannot uh, distribute that uh, comfortably. So our goal is to push it to uh, an open source 
uh, up to an open source format. So uh, first step in 2018, releasing uh, modules, standalone modules, and second step later to release the core of docs, so all the interfaces to produce VTS projects. So don't forget that behind the tools there is a process. Uh, so our way to, to see the cycle of a CubeSat development is here. We can comment that uh, during the demo if you want, but I can't uh, take any more. So don't forget, a tool is a tool. The process behind uh, is called space engineering. I could also uh, provide some comments about the feedback we had in the com uh, engineering campaign, and we try to interface with a uh, with community, of you uh, with a concurrent engineering community. So just uh, keep in mind, uh, we are Space Labs, but uh, we are quite new in France, especially in CubeSat's story. So we have to develop uh, new skills. So we are at the same level like uh, many, many others. Uh, and CRS is dedicated to produce CubeSats for science because we believe that this format is a good, very good alternative to heavy processes in, um, in, uh, in the uh, space agency's programmatics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. <laughs> um, so, anyone has a question? So, meanwhile, while they are being shy, uh, I might <laughs> ask you something like, uh, what uh, led you to, what motivated you to build your own propagator? Uh, there was something in the other tools that you that wasn't enough, or well, uh, at first, we, as you saw, we have eight projects in uh, in the box at the moment. One of the projects uh, is dedicated to space geodesy, and we wanted to have a, a very fine-tuned gravitational model in the box. So uh, it was quite difficult to integrate that to existing tools. So we decided to make it by our, by our ourselves, and then we see we thought. It's a good way to push it further and then to make maybe a, a library of uh, fine-tuned gravitational models for proximity operations about bodies as long um, uh, uh, and to update it uh, each time that a new model uh, or a new body of the solar system uh, uh, has been explored. So and the second motivation is the time step. So we want to prepare uh, onboard space data, and uh, you cannot uh, you cannot store. Uh, well, it doesn't mean anything to 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 compute a one second time step uh, deep space trajectory, but uh, it doesn't mean also anything to compute a one month time step uh, deep space trajectory if you have a flyby at the end. So we had we had to have a, a flexible time step. So second big motivation, and Thank we don't want STK. <laughs> Any question? Yeah. So you said uh, about uh, energy analysis on trajectory. Do you have in mind to implement something for thermal analysis, fluxes on? Uh, uh, yes, we have that in mind. That's probably the, the most complicated. Uh, I mean, and in particular, the the link between uh, thermal analysis and power generation. So at the moment, we have I would say primitive models for battery and cells, but we know that uh, their performances are deeply uh, coupled with uh, thermal, uh, thermal analysis. So it will be the next step. Uh, a first way is to, uh, a first, uh, first way, uh, a first approach is to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, to develop the, the worst cases and then to see if uh, in the uh, coldest case uh, you have enough power and in the, but at least EPS, allows you not to oversize your system. And uh, that, uh, that was our first uh, priority. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, the relation between open source and commercial and uh, closed source. And I agree to the point that uh, that should not be a fight between each other, but uh, at least there should be an alternative. And so far it's mostly closed source and uh, we are trying to build an alternative to this and uh, to to promote space exploration as a whole. Uh, but my question is rather on these uh, CCSTS standards that you mentioned. By the way, uh, who knows a little bit about CCSTS here in the audience? <laughs> okay, there's some. Great. Do you even know what CCSTS stands for? What does it mean? The abbreviation, it's, well, it's too complicated. But um, 
My question is, so you're using the uh, CCSDS formats, but there are not so many that actually fit that purpose. And what I've seen is that you kind of took what is there and tweaked it to your needs, to some of the use cases. Mm -hmm. um, the question is now, do you also intend to kind of feedback, for example, if you have uh, some certain files that you exchange that are not, th th that you're doing in your tweaked uh, CCSDS format, are you going to... Uh, bring this back to the CCSDS organization and suggest it as a new standard? Well, uh, that's what uh, I would call the, uh, uh, my involvement in the community of concurrent engineering uh, people. So for instance here, I am, I am dealing with Jean-Luc Legal, who is the interface uh, at the French agency CNES uh, for, uh, for uh, concurrent engineering tools. So he is the best entry point to uh, promote some changes or some interfaces to new formats. So uh, we are concerned by that, at least, to, to be able to interact. Thanks. Thank you very much. Boris? <laughs> And let me now welcome on stage Alexander Lil. Um, he's a master's student in computer science and a focused mainly on uh, software ar architecture and clean coding please thank you very much Come in. and <coughs> he will talk about open sourcing modular and maintainable cubesat software thank you so as we're a bit behind schedule and everybody's getting hungry and it's getting colder and colder in this room uh, i'll try to speed up things a bit <laughs> um right so I'm going to tell you a bit about um, our process of open sourcing a modular and maintainable CubeSat software um, at our project Move2. Um, a bit of background. Move2 is a CubeSat project um, at the Technical University of Munich, um, sponsored by the DLR, and the kickoff was in April 2015. We are building a one-unit CubeSat uh, with prototypes of new solar cells as payload. And we're flying uh, about 600 kilometers sun synchronous orbit, and we will launch uh, the first two quarters next year. Um, it's not really sure yet because our launch kept on being delayed. Um, now it's currently up to second quarter. So, what is this going to be about? Um, this is more about software. Um, we're using for hardware commercial off the shelf parts. Own on board computer, electric power system from client space. Um, we have a lot of different in house developments. Um, this is, for example, uh, ADCS using Matitalkers. We have uh, own built UHF, VHF transceivers, S band transceiver. We have um, the solar cell measurement circuitry on the top panel that you can see here on the top um, that we built ourselves. Um, the structures, um, in house development, and also the deployment mechanism is also made in-house. The software we also develop, but uh, there's a few limitations. Um, we're using GNU Linux as operating system, so we didn't develop this ourselves, obviously. Um, we use lots of different tools that are available open source. For example, QEMO, um, SystemD, including System Control, Joint Control, Dbus, LibUV, MinInny, and some other different libraries and packages. Um, for the custom software, we basically wrote all the daemons software ourselves that um, communicates with the hardware. We built daemons that use other daemons um, to control them. But we have lots of different system management scripts that we use to run our satellite or to change modes and so on. We built uh, Inidram FS as a basic rescue mode if our Linux cannot boot. And we have lots of different helper scripts and tools for different development activities. So I will go a bit more into detail in the software architecture. So in the middle, you can see Dbus. This is our central messaging bus that we use in the satellite. And you can see in the bottom the SPI bus, for example, and the I2C bus, and some temperature sensors over one wire. On the very bottom, you can now see the hardware that we have to communicate with. This is the different boards, um, it's about nine boards, and we wrote the software that's communicating with each hardware board. Um, so 
Then we have a few components that basically do not talk with hardware. Um, you can now see here, for example, the two smart activator. It's just internal names, I'm sorry. Um, this is basically the deployment mechanism um, program that starts the deployment. And we have the beacon data collector that queries all the different subsystem daemons that you can see in the middle um, for beacon data that is going to be sent out via our communications link. Additionally, we have a so-called rescue tool. It was basically imagined as a tool for rescuing the satellite if the other commanding tools do not work due to time constraints. We did not implement the other commanding tools and now always use the rescue tool to command the satellite. It works pretty good. It's stable and I mean that's what should be the rescue tool, right? So um, we use this for commanding the satellite and this is basically bash commands or just like shell commands we send up there and then we can trigger different scripts, um, send communication over the D-Bus and so on. Furthermore, uh, we also have some autonomy on our satellite. Um, it's basically a mechanism that triggers a safe mode if it gets too hot or if the battery runs out of power. Um, we conveniently called it Horst because we didn't think of a better name. Um, before that, just as a side story, uh, before that we always said this is the thing that controls the satellite, um, the commander or the mechanism or we had different phrases for this and at some point we just said let's just give it a name, any name is better than no name. Um, and this horse is basically controlling the other demons and automatically executing commands to save the satellite because we only have overpasses a few times a day, of course. <coughs> so, for our architecture, we have lots of different chances that we gain by this architecture. We are using a normal operating system, so this takes care of the hardware abstraction and we can basically, for example, use the I2C kernel driver from Linux to talk to our I2C devices. Um, but it also comes, of course, with different limitations. Um, for the re reusability of our software, of course, you need Linux on your satellite. <laughs> um, so if you have only a microcontroller, this is not going to work out. And um, also the CPU might be a limiting factor because of uh, the performance that we need because Linux comes with an overhead, of course. <coughs> For the downsides of open sourcing our software, we thought you probably know Aiken's third law. Design is an iterative process. The num necessary number of iterations is one more than the number you have currently done. And uh, this is true at any point in time. <coughs> So we are open sourcing software that's not perfect, but it is open sourced either to have a look at it or to improve it further. And this is going to be this one missing iteration uh, until you read the statement again. Um, another downside for open sourcing our software is that uh, we need to document it before because I think open sourcing software without documentation is worthless, except it's good enough code that doesn't need documentation. <coughs> and it might also uh, give some additional workload to open source software because sometimes you think it's good enough for us, um, but if I'm going to open source it, I want it to be fancy and pretty and do whatever what. So this is another possible downside of open sourcing our software. Um, the last thing I put this in parentheses because uh, giving away technology advantage uh, is not really the case for us. Um, we're basically just writing normal software. There's no special algorithms, no special architecture involved. Um, I think it's just logic and good reason behind everything. And I think everybody could come up with this himself. <coughs> Upsides of open sourcing software. Aiken's third law again. Um, I don't know, like one upside of open sourcing software is that the people that use the software can then improve it and do this next iteration. Um, the need for documentation that we had as a downside is also motivation, motiv motivation for documentation. So we have a couple of developers that say, I don't need to write documentation because I know how it works. But once we open source it, it's a good reason to write documentation for other people to use it and to reuse it and to improve it. Um, we also want to have feedback on our code. So we hope that um, people will look at the code and say this might be maybe a, fu a future bug 
that we don't know yet or just to get some feedback on how we design the system. We also want to help other satellite developers uh, either for reusing it or just as reference, which is um, coupled to the next point, we want to demystify rocket and satellite science. Uh, because, for example, I thought always um, the software for satellite it has to be uh, highly complex and I can't even imagine and what not and not. And in, in reality, it's software. Um, we want to also show uh, our capabilities of our team. It's a student project. We had uh, about 120 students working on the satellite uh, voluntarily um, for some studying credits, but other than that, voluntarily. Um, so we want to show what is capable with a um, purely voluntary student team, what we can achieve. Um, we also want to enable and promote collaboration, of course and we want to show others how to write code. But we also want to show others how to not write code. <laughs> <coughs> so, then I would say um, let's come to some selected examples. Um, we just talked about Horst. It controls which components are powered on and what they're doing. It receives diva signals and triggers routines depending on conditions. Reusability is high, I would say. Um, the routines are bash scripts that are triggered, and the signals um, are currently debug signals, but they can be replaced by any other signal because we use a fancy event loop that can basically get anything into the routine. The code quality of this is high. Documentation quality is also high. So the overall score of reusing this component, given the implications I said before, is high. Another example is the rescue tool. It, for once, it's one simple protocol, um, how to send commands to a satellite and back, but it also um, is an application that um, is used for commanding and file transfers. So we can basically send up commands and download the outputs of this. Um, re reusability is medium because it's unfortunately coupled with the com daemon and the nanolink protocol. The nanolink protocol is something that we uh, invented for the low-level protocol for the communication with the satellite between the ground station and the satellite. <coughs> and the com daemon is uh, highly coupled with this tool with a shared library. So this might be a bit of a problem. We also implement our own SPI protocol. Um, so <coughs> the reusability is like medium. The code quality is high. The documentation quality is medium, and so the overall score, I would say, is medium. So now let's come to the last counterexample. The EPS daemon allows controlling of the electric power system. It provides all the functions over a DBUS interface. The reusa reusability is high because it communicates with a commercial off-the-shelf hardware from flight space, and I think lots of people that use this hardware might be interested in software that already works with this hardware. The code quality, though, has lots of room for improvement. <laughs> um, documentation quality is medium, and so therefore the overall score is low to medium. So those were the few examples. For the summary, I would say the modular architecture allows to reuse high-level components and with limitations to low-level components. Um, we think that software is very important as reference for others and brings a huge potential for learning because reading software alone is a huge help for others, no matter if it's good software or bad software, because you can always learn how not to do it. Um, due to time constraints, we did not use possi possibly existing frameworks. Um, I saw a lot of talks in the future um, about frameworks for the software um, and we also didn't try to build one because a uh, hastily built framework is, de is doomed to not be reused. Um, summarizing, we will lo launch uh, in the next half a year, I guess, and the open source plans are basically going to happen after launch because until then we are busy with uh, developing and testing. Okay. Thank you very much. And now we have some time for questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. So there's there's a question okay. there. Yes. Okay.
Okay. <laughs> Just one thing. Um, is Nico Bucher around? Or okay, good. So, uh, did you use a coding starter or something for uh, designing the software, something like that? And also, what were your testing procedures? Did you use the unit testing, uh, system testing, end to end? Yeah, so um, for one thing, um, we set up some basic um, coding guidelines that we wrote ourselves because in the beginning the code was basically, depending on the developer, highly different from the others. And we also had a formal merge request procedure where we make sure that uh, the code is not only understood by one developer. Um, for the testing part, we have to admit that we didn't really find the time to implement unit tests. Uh, but I think um, we learned from this project that it's important to write them right from the beginning and we spend lots of time by manually testing everything. So, of course, the time cost by doing this is high, but in the beginning we didn't really implement unit tests and we always had the task to do them later, but I think you all know how this is. Uh, let's write the tests later and then, oh wait. Uh, New project. Yeah. Did this uh, answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, I'm going on to the next one. <laughs> do you have any hard real time requirements on your mission and how do you expect to meet them you by using uh, daemons? Okay, so um, for our mission, we don't have any real time requirements. Um, so we just use the standard Linux distribution because our requirements do not, do not require real time operating system, for example. Um, but I could imagine that um, we could also uh, use a real-time operating system um, because I think the, the software can be adjusted to that. Thank you, there's another question there. Okay, hi, my name is Frank Rieger. I work here in Flight Dynamics and uh, yeah, we all know testing is not much fun. Documenting stuff is even less fun. But from the Schiaparelli experience, we have seen that onboard software can be complex, but in some cases might not be complex enough to actually fit the bill. So uh, if you are not testing your software or only superficially testing your software, you might run the chance that you end up in the 50% of the CubeSats where you don't want to be. So what are you seriously doing about that? Okay. so. I have to clarify, we don't have automated unit tests, but we have a very strict procedure how new features and functions are tested after they have been implemented. So we normally go ahead and um, test all the daemon functions, for example, by hand and have scripts that test, like they call daemon functions. So we rather focused on integration and system tests, but not unit tests. So we have a testing team. We have a uh, assembly integration testing subsystem and they um, normally do the tests. Uh, but also we have other developers that are doing those tests. So um, I actually have uh, another presentation for this uh, about the uh, agile development that we did in our project. Um, where I, so we basically said we don't have time for unit tests. We'd rather focus on the integration and system tests because lots of cube submissions, from my understanding, write unit tests and test the low-level functions, but in the end, they run out of time and don't do system integration tests. So they know that every component works by itself, but they never tested, tested the whole system. So we said we'd rather test the whole system and not write unit tests. Thank you. There's another question here. Hey, um, thanks for the talk. Um, I understand that your time limitation is you know, quite substantial. Um, but would you be open to external contributions? And if yes, what would be your first priority? Like, where would you find more help? And the second question is about the um, ground segment. Um, if you can discuss a bit about that. So the first question was about if we would do it again, or if you will, like right now, until the end of the until the launch of the project, uh, are you open to external contributions? And if yes, what would be your priorities? Like, where would you need help on? And the second one is about your ground segment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, on we basically rescheduled, <coughs> sorry, the, the the open sourcing of the project to after the launch because right now we basically have enough developers or the system is basically good as it is, 
So it's it fulfills requirements, and we would like to not do too much changes anymore because we want to basically reach threshold of uh, changes and test them before we launch. Um, so therefore, um, I would say um, open sourcing afterwards because we also have updating possibilities for the software. Um, so if there's critical bugs, we can still update the software. Um, or just um, to use it in the future missions. And for the ground segment, um, what is the, the more specific question? Like, what would your ground segment be? Which bands, and are you running your ground segment yourself? Like, are you building it from scratch? Yeah, so basically we built our um, ground segment um, from scratch. Um, we have uh, the hardware at the university, and we used GNU Radio in the beginning, um, but then uh, changed to writing it ourselves because it was the performance was not too good. And um, for other parts, we basically um, reuse uh, open source software for the ground segment. Which bands and encodings? Um, UHF, VHF, and S band. And uh, I think we can discuss this in detail cool. afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? If not, then no, no, I will thank Alex. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, this concludes our um, Astro Dynamics session. And I would like to thank all the, speaker, the speakers and all of you guys for uh, being so uh, interested in, in this topic. And I'll leave the word to Arthur. Yeah. OK, so thanks, Elena, for chairing the session. And uh, we are going to have a break now until 12.